Just got the notice we're being live streamed. Are we ready to go, Patrick? Commodore, we're live. Good morning, all. Good afternoon on the East Coast. Welcome to OPCOM. This is the biannual meeting that the auxiliary holds where the members of the national staff come and present their plans, their accomplishments, and their challenges. In my opinion, this is probably the most informative meeting we have, and I think it's excellent that we get to live stream this and allow every member of the auxiliary that's interested to take part. Back when I was a chief of staff of District 1 SR, I attended my first end train and they made a big deal out of the fact that they were going to allow us as the Commodore and Chief of Staff to attend this meeting. At the end of the meeting, I go, this was outrageous. This was so much information. I learned so much about the auxiliary. What was this classified? Um, this is not your, we, we hear the, the, the term very often, this is not your father's auxiliary. And, and, and it, one thing that's constant in this organization is change. While RBS is our primary mission, we do so much more. Everything from culinary support, food service for us old timers, to cybersecurity, from clergy support to administrative investigations. You name it, we do it. We have a membership that has a lifetime of experience and expertise, pretty much everything. You know, a year or so back, I, I was joking, an admiral mentioned to me that he was surprised, you know, what can't we do? I said, we have experts in everything. You should just be glad that we have no intention to go nuclear. You know, I, 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 you laugh. I mentioned that at the uh, 9 East D train and about five people raised their hands. They go, I could do that. You know, <laughs> they worked for various government contractors producing nuclear weapons and, and, and reactors. So you name it, we'll get it done. Um, but today is the day that you get all this information. Now, you're not here to listen to me. You're li here to listen to the folks that get the work done, our tremendous members that have demonstrated not only what they can do, which by itself is impressive, but what they have done and what they will continue to do during a pandemic. You know, that, that, that's just amazing. So with that said, Vineco, please take it away. Took me a second to unmute. Welcome everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome our amazing national staff, national board, and a special welcome goes out to all our members who are joining us via YouTube today. Uh, you'll find this meeting very informative. You'll get uh, an ex ex excellent view of what your national staff is doing for you and the progress that's being made in the background. So I thank you once again for joining that. With that, Mrs. Barth, would you be so kind as to introduce our first guest speaker? Absolutely. It is my pleasure to introduce Rear Admiral John Mogger. Rear Admiral Mogger serves as the Assistant Commandant for Prevention Policy and is responsible for the development of national policy, standards, and programs promoting marine safety, security, and environmental stewardship. Three directorates carry out the mission, inspections and compliance, marine transportation systems, and commercial regulations and standards. During his prior flag assignments, he served as the Assistant Commandant for Capability, responsible for identifying and providing capabilities, competencies, and capacity, along with developing standards for the staffing, training, equipment, equipping, sustaining, maintaining, and employing Coast Guard forces to meet mission requirements. He also served as the Director of Training and Exercises at U.S. Cyber Command, where he developed joint training and assessment standards and orchestrated over two dozen large-scale exercises for the cyber mission forces, partner nations, interagencies, all services, National Guard, reserves, and private industry. Previous assignments include serving as the commanding officer of the Coast Guard Marine Safety Center, where he served as the Coast Guard's lead technical authority for the implementation of commercial safety, security, and environmental protection regulations. 
He also served as the Chief Office of Design at Engineering Standards at Coast Guard Headquarters, where he led the development of safety and environmental protection standards for international shipping and offshore oil and gas activity. Rear Admiral Mauger also served as military assistant to the director, Office of Net Assessment at the Pentagon, where he advised senior defense leaders on competitive strategies. The Coast Guard's lead budget analyst for the service's 1.4 billion acquisition appropriation and the chief of staff for the Department of Homeland Security's 2008 presidential transition team. His operational assignments include overseeing commercial port operations in Charleston, South Carolina, where he enforced maritime safety and security regulations in one of the nation's strategic commercial and military ports, conducting commercial vessel inspections and casualty investigations at Activities Europe, an assistant engineering officer of a high endurance cutter in Honolulu, Hawaii. His staff tours include service as chief of commercial vessel security during the national response to the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, and as an engineer at the Marine Safety Center and the Electronics Engineering Center. Rear Admiral Mager earned a Bachelor of Science with Honors from the Coast Guard Academy in 1991, a Master of Science with Honors from Worsh Worcester Polytechnic Institute in 1997, and a Master of Science with Distinction from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces at National Defense University in 2011. He is a 2009 Fellow of the Graduate School's Executive Potential Program and a 2011 Graduate of Defense Acquisition University's Senior Acquisition Course. A native of Jenkintown, Pennsylvania, Rear Admiral Mager resides in Arlington, Virginia, with his wife, Leah, and two children. Admiral Mager? Terry, thanks so much. Uh, really appreciate that kind introduction. And it took you uh, almost as long to read all that as, me, as I did. It took me to do it. But uh, thanks so much for going over that. I, I am calling you uh, all uh, from home today. Um, and it's truly an honor to be able to spend time with you uh, this afternoon. Um, much like all of you, uh, these shoulder boards don't give me any special privileges at home. And uh, one of those two kids uh, here in the house is a high school senior who's the drum major in the uh, high school marching band. They've got a competition in a few hours and the trucks need to be loaded and unloaded and props put together and all that stuff. So unfortunately, I won't be able to be with you all day. There are some bass drums and some uh, big old props that uh, need to get moved. And my job this afternoon is loading and unloading the trailers. That said, uh, it really means a lot for me, able to, for me to be able to uh, spend some time with you and personally thank you for all of the uh, tremendous contributions that you and your auxiliaries make to the nation uh, and to the Coast Guard. As the Assistant Commandant for uh, Prevention Policy, my primary focus is really ensuring the safety, security, and stewardship of the maritime transportation system. This is an amazing network that contributes over $5.4 trillion to the United States uh, economy and provides over 31 million jobs uh, for our people. And my team here uh, really uh, covers across the whole role of uh, regulatory uh, aspects uh, when it comes to uh, the maritime transportation system. We make sure that the mariners are properly trained and credentialed, that the vessels and facilities are designed, built, and maintained in accordance with uh, safety and security standards, and that our waterways are properly marked and safe for navigation. Uh, but we also make sure that our auxiliary and our recreational boating safety functions are properly resourced and, and managed. And so for that reason, it's really important uh, for me to uh, be here with you today to uh, spend a little bit of time listening to uh, what you've been able to do and the, and the challenges and opportunities ahead. The job that I have is huge, uh, but it's really rewarding job. And I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to work with the selfless women and men uh, of, of who conduct this mission across our civilian, military, and auxiliary workforce. What I'd like to do uh, over the course of the next few minutes is give you a sense of some of the, the forces re that are reshaping uh, our world of work and provide some specific insights and highlights into how the auxiliaries are supporting our efforts 
and then highlight what I'm doing with my staff to ensure the readiness of our forces. I thought Nako and, and Vinico really set up this uh, discussion well by talking about the various missions that the auxiliary does and the amount of change uh, that uh, they see, as well as the desire to continually adapt and meet those changes. When I came into the job in June, I was really thrilled to celebrate the 82nd anniversary of uh, the auxiliary. We've seen tremendous change over these last eight plus decades of service. And I really appreciate the auxiliary's continued embracement of the core missions while also seeking opportunities to contribute in new ways through new missions and new opportunities to bring that expertise that you all have. And I'm gonna highlight a few examples of that as I go on. But let me tell you, we're in another period of really uh, great change right now. And this is affecting us both personally and professionally. And there's going to be even more opportunities for auxiliary contributions going forward. So let me take a couple of minutes just to talk about the forces that I see driving those changes and, and how they play out in our work, what we're doing about it, and where I already see auxiliaries making key contributions. When we think about the forces that are reshaping the world of work that uh, um, I, I'm responsible for, we think of it as uh, three main forces and we call it the triple challenge. First and foremost, there's a desire to get more capacity out of uh, the maritime transportation system. See this in a number of different ways, uh, playing along all of the coastlines uh, around the US and up in the inland waterways. First, there's a desire for more, uh, greater use of traditional means. This means larger ships or more frequent calls, more exports, more varied export missions uh, or products uh, coming out of the US. But we also see growth in new opportunities too. It's growth in space and, and commercial space launch and the impacts that that has to uh, our waterway, both for launch and recovery missions. It's growth in, in things like offshore renewable energy installations, which provide ways for the maritime transportation to, system to contribute to the nation's decarbonization goals of, by building 30 gigawatts of uh, offshore renewable power by 2030. And so these challenges pose a, a, a number of different things uh, for the Coast Guard. And, and we have to be ready to make sure that we can meet both the growth in traditional mission areas and in these new mission areas. But it's not just the commercial sector, it's also the growth in recreational and the diversity of recreational boating use as well. You all know that in 2020, we saw one of the largest growths of uh, boating uh, out there on the water. And unfortunately, that corresponded with an, a sharp increase in the number of deaths as well. And so it's really more important than ever that we go after or that we maintain focus on our key missions uh, while uh, making sure that we're bringing in new capabilities and thinking about new ways to uh, get after uh, this, this challenging growth. One example of the challenging growth that, that's had on our nation is this uh, oil spill that happened uh, in, uh, off the coast of uh, Los Angeles, Long Beach, just a few weeks ago. Huge response by the sector, and I'm sure that there were many auxiliarists involved in supporting the sector in that response. Uh, and, and, you know, really uh, bravo Zulu to the folks that were involved in that. As the Assistant Commandant in Prevention Policy, I was there to make sure that we were under, able to understand uh, the growth in congestion along the port and, and thoroughly investigate the cause of this casualty. So we, I think you at all may have seen from uh, public reporting that we identified that it was likely that a vessel may have drug a pipeline uh, and that may have contributed uh, to this spill at some point. So we did a, a bunch of research to, to identify vessels and found one vessel in particular and wanted to make sure that we did a thorough boarding and an investigation of it. One of the challenges that we had is the foreign language crew members, uh, the officers that were involved spoke Slavic and we needed to get somebody that uh, spoke Slavic on short notice. Of course, we immediately turned to the auxiliary and we had auxiliarist Dusan Tatomirovich join uh, our uh, boarding team with only uh, just a few days notice uh, to provide key interpretation skills for our investigating officer. I can't thank uh, Dusan and uh, the crew out at uh, D11 enough uh, for their contribution. 
But it's not just the increase in capacity that's changing the operating environment. It's also a drive for zero impact uh, environmentally from the maritime transportation system. And so this drive for sustainability at the same time we're growing is really presents a conundrum for us. The drive for sustainability and zero environmental impact for shipping plays out in a number of ways. There's a large effort that's being driven by both consumers, uh, by both feder uh, governments, uh, federal and international governments, and even in some cases state governments to decarbonize uh, shipping and, and make sure that it's not contributing to uh, greenhouse gases. The Coast Guard's been working domestically to, to um, do pilot projects where we test alternative fuels and we're looking forward to the launch of a hydrogen fuel ferry uh, and entry into service later this year. We've been working for years uh, on uh, uh, decarbonization, reduce of uh, uh, greenhouse gases through uh, LNG uh, as an alternative fuel and looking at other alternative fuels and alternative power sources. Internationally, we work very closely with the International Maritime Organization to make sure that uh, there, there are appropriate standards since much of the, the world shipping is, is by international means and they're on a target path to decarbonize international shipping over the course of uh, the next 20 years. But it's not just the shipping impacts, it's also the work that's going on in sensitive areas like the Arctic. And so earlier uh, this summer, back in early July, we launched the Healy on a circumnavigation of the North American continent. First time in, in uh, over five years that the Healy has gone through uh, the Northwest Passage. And so uh, just earlier this week, I was able to meet Healy uh, on her uh, transit around uh, the North American continent off uh, up in the Chesapeake here uh, on, her, on her approach to Baltimore. I was really uh, both uh, surprised uh, and inspired to meet two auxiliarists that are, had joined uh, Healy on her circumnavigation trip. Auxiliarist uh, Pat Wolcott from uh, D13 and Auxiliarist uh, Joe uh, Woodbury from D7 uh, volunteered as a culinary specialist to and spent the whole trip from uh, 7 July uh, back through uh, the end of November when she gets back into Seattle, circumnavigating the North American continent with the crew of Healy. Joe and Pat put together an awesome meal and it was great to share stories with them, hear about their experience uh, and their service to the nation in their prior careers and their continued desire to volunteer and support the nation and, and our Coast Guard. I couldn't be thankful enough for them. And so in order to grow the system while at the same time reducing the environmental footprint, the only way that you're gonna do that is by getting increasingly complex and increasingly automated. And that's the last challenge, this increasing complexity of the maritime transportation system and the drive for much more automation than already exists. And so we see this playing out in autonomous uh, ships that are used to recover rockets and might someday be used to launch rockets. Uh, we see this playing out in increasing digitalization of the fleet. And, and that poses a lot of opportunity, but it also poses key risks. And one of those key risks is cybersecurity. And so we've been laser focused as an organization at making sure that we um, resource our capabilities to uh, support and protect the maritime transportation system from cyber attacks. Been very fortunate to work with uh, Commandant and uh, Vice Admiral Bushman to put together a cybersecurity strategic outlook that puts protection of the maritime transportation system front and center of the Coast Guard strategy for the next five years. And so here again, this is another opportunity where we've turned to the auxiliary for their expertise. And, and I am so grateful for the work that uh, Joe Espino and Cliff Neve have done both to stand up a cybersecurity uh, organization within the auxiliary and then contribute uh, to our active duty missions by bringing their expertise. That type of work is only gonna grow and increase uh, both in importance and uh, in, in relevance to our mission. And so I look forward to those continued opportunities. So what are we doing to get the Coast Guard uh, forces ready to address this challenge? Um, 
earlier this year, Vice Admiral Bushman and Vice Admiral Thomas jointly signed out a prevention readiness initiative that really charges me and empowers me and my team with putting in place the key capabilities, the key personnel policies, and the key partnerships that we need to build a ready prevention workforce. And the auxiliary is gonna be a key part of that. Our prevention readiness initiative is focused on the people, the governance, and the technology. Those three things are needed to really drive readiness. On the people, it's about providing the right number of people in the right locations, but also supporting them with the type of training, continuous training that they're gonna need over the course of their career to remain ready. On the governance side, it's about building new partnerships and new stakeholders and getting the right policies out there uh, at the time that they're needed in order to uh, drive these changes forward. On the technology side, it's about leveraging all of the Coast Guard's investments in that standard technology infrastructure, but building out mobile capabilities and, and uh, additional uh, tools such as the Missile Inspect app to allow our people to work better. Um, we know that we have more challenges ahead, but again, the auxiliary is right, right beside us. As we've taken a look through the Prevention Readiness Initiative at issues that we need to improve within the realm of Mariner credentialing, I've had the benefit of having uh, being able to work with D1 Auxiliarist uh, Richard Mihalicek and uh, Auxiliarist Doug Cream. And they've really brought their expertise in law enforcement and their expertise in uh, uh, credentialing activities to help us track down Mariners using technology and getting after uh, some of those challenges that we face. And so across the whole mission set here within 5P, the auxiliary is right there uh, beside us. And I am so grateful for their work. In closing, I'd like to just reinforce what NACO said at the opening. We're in dynamic times and, and our operating environment is continuously changing and changing in dramatic ways. We need to continually observe, orient, decide and act in order to be effective in this complex environment. It's comforting to me to know that everywhere I turn, uh, the auxiliarists are there uh, ready and willing and able to support. I am grateful for your contributions and inspired by your service. Thanks so much for your uh, time this morning. Thank you, Rear Admiral Morgan. Your words are greatly appreciated. Thank you. Mrs. Barth, would you be so kind as to introduce our next guest speaker? Absolutely. It is my honor to introduce Vice Admiral Scott Bushman. Vice Admiral Bushman assumed the duties of the Coast Guard Deputy Commandant for Operations in June 2020. In this capacity, he's responsible for the development of operational strategy, policy, guidance, and resources that address national priorities. This oversight of Coast Guard missions, programs, and services includes intelligence, international affairs, cyber, the maritime transportation system, commercial regulations and inspections, search and rescue, maritime security, law enforcement, defense operations, environmental response, contingency planning, and the operational capabilities of cutter, boat, aviation, shore, and deployable specialized forces. Prior flag officer assignments include- Terry, can you hear me? I can. I hate to be very rude here, but uh, first off, it's good to hear your voice. Good to see you again. Can I maybe just interrupt here and, and summarize summarize uh, your words there? Sure. Yeah, well, uh, what Terry's gonna say is I've had a lot of jobs. I've loved every minute of it. And I think this is about my 20th job in the Coast Guard. But uh, if that's okay, Terry, I'll just say th thanks for introducing me here. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Terry, for the introduction. Sorry to cut you off there, but uh, really just an honor to be here today. As Adam Walker said, honor for him, honor for me to be here today. I have got a lot of experience in my career with the Coast Guard Auxiliary, all very positive. Uh, don't know that uh, there's a bigger supporter, a bigger fan of the Coast Guard Auxiliary than me. Um, and I just know what a force multiplier you are for all the women and men in the, in the um, Coast Guard Auxiliary, and, and you're just a force multiplier for the world's best Coast Guard. Um, talk, Commodore Maluski, talk about all the things you're doing. Um, and I had an opportunity to speak to your national board uh, some months ago, and I think I'll talk a little bit about uh, along the same lines what I talked about then, but, and that's really all the things the Coast Guard is up to 
some of which Admiral Mauger highlighted uh, both domestically and globally. Um, if you've heard the comment on talk, and I'm sure you've heard our, our uh, extraordinary comment on talk about us being the world's uh, best Coast Guard, and, and, and I think we are the world's best Coast Guard, and there's a lot of reasons for that. And uh, one of them is um, we're an organization with about 40,000 active duty personnel, a little more than 20,000 auxiliarists, uh, 6,000 plus reserves, and about 8,000 civilians. And I really can't think of too many organizations that have these various different pieces of it. You know, a civilian corps, that's kind of the glue that is our expertise. As folks like me come and go, there's reserve force being call upon, uh, the active duty force, and then this auxiliary force that, uh, you know, loves the organization as much as I do because they do it, uh, they do it, uh, without any pay. And uh, when you see these pieces of the organization come together, I would say you know, we've had a lot of bad hurricanes in the past few years. And when you have a hurricane response and you see those pieces of the organization come together, from my perspective, just it's just a sight to behold. So uh, it's really uh, fitting that the world's best Coast Guard has the world's best volunteer force, and, and that is you. Um, Commandant talks about us being a global Coast Guard. He talks just about being an era of Coast Guards. And he talks about uh, the demand for Coast Guard service has never been higher. And, and I, from my seat, that, that couldn't be um, more true. Um, I'm the person that uh, frequently represents the, the, co the Commandant at, at the Pentagon, at the Department of Homeland Security, at the National Security Council, and in the interagency here in Washington, D.C. Um, this is just this week, I testified before Congress from our uh, House Oversight Committee, really in, in uh, and the testimony was about mission balance, and it was really about the congressional interest in how many different uh, demands are getting put on the Coast Guard, how do we balance all those different things, and how do we make sure we're adequately resourced. So today, I think what I'll do is just maybe expand on the Commandant's comments, talk about some of our recent activities. Um, so when the Commandant talks about things like, you know, an era of Coast Guard, what does that really mean? You know, you can look, kind of look at statistics and say, you know, in the 2010 on, um, you look at what's other what some other countries around the world did. You know, China increased the size of its Coast Guard by 73%, uh, Philippines by 100%, Vietnam by 73%. You can numerically look at that. What, and now what that really means is other countries in the world recognize the value of the Coast Guard and what a Coast Guard means in the maritime environment to be able to protect their sovereignty. Uh, a little bit, little bit less than a year ago, we drafted a document here within, within my office that the Commandant signed called the Tri-Service Maritime Strategy, uh, Vantage at Sea it was called. He signed it along with the Chief of Naval Operations of the Commandant Marine Corps. And what one of the statements in that uh, in that strategy is that the Coast Guard's mission profile will make it the preferred maritime security partner for many nations vulnerable to coercion. So I think we see folks really recognizing the value of the Coast Guard um, here and abroad. I certainly here in Washington, D.C., in our own country, people realize the value of a Coast Guard. Uh, and I've been in this job for about 15 months. Part of that I was a land area commander. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the interviews, as I said, with the National Security Council staff. And there's a number of things our national security apparatus in this country has been focused on that really uh, involve the Coast Guard. Um, that's why you've seen Coast Guard cutters recently deploy to Asia, to the Black Sea. South Atlantic, Eastern Pacific, to name just a few. Um, all of that happened in the middle of a pandemic with some real challenges of getting the crew ready to sail in the middle of a global pandemic. Or not too long ago, there was a devastating earthquake in Haiti. And who was the first there? The United States Coast Guard was there, rescuing hundreds of folks, getting hundreds of folks to higher level medical care, um, and getting first responders into a very remote area in the southern part of Haiti. Before anyone else showed up, we were there for days. Uh, we did not go to Antarctica this year due to COVID, but we do go to the Arctic several times. Polar Star went north in the winter time, first time in the winter, furthest north ever in the winter. And as Admiral Mauger uh, mentioned, the Healy just uh, is, the, is finishing up and really had a start passage through the Northwest Pass from Seattle, northern part of Canada, into Greenland, into the Baffin Base, doing some extraordinary science, extraordinary research. I was just up there the past two days. As Admiral Mauger said, the crew ate well because they had a couple of uh, – auxiliary chefs on board. Um, so a lot of things going on with the Coast Guard globally uh, does not mean we're losing our domestic focus. 
Uh, quite the opposite. I would tell you we had another uh, very busy hurricane season. We're getting towards the tail end of that. Over 20 named storms again this year. And another devastating one that hit the Gulf states again after a, a terrible year last year in the Gulf states. This one hit kind of right in Louisiana. And uh, we certainly appreciate the efforts of the auxiliary and those types of events right there in some of the incident management activities. Admiral Mauger talked about uh, search and rescue and up due to COVID. A little bit of surprising in March of 2020 when we all went into lockdown, you know, how that was all going to play out. But we started to see, you went into a store, when stores started to open back up again, you couldn't buy a bicycle, you couldn't buy an exercise piece of exercise equipment because people were looking for those outlets that they needed. And you couldn't buy a boat. You couldn't buy a boat, couldn't rent a boat because uh, people were just out there buying boats. Figure they go out there with their family and social distance. So as Admiral Mauger mentioned, number of boat purchases up, number of first-time boaters up for the first time in many years. And with that, unfortunately, comes an increase in fatalities, which we saw. Um, and I was just up there talking to, uh, to the National Association of Boating Law Administrators. I really want to thank you. I want to thank everyone for the roles because... You know, first-time boaters, boating education is pretty important. Tough to do boating education when you couldn't be in person. So that brought in virtual options. And folks had to adapt and, and provide those uh, virtual options. Um, Admiral Walker talked about the oil spill um, in California recently. A big, big event, the role of the auxiliary in providing some, uh, some of the interpreter skills. But it really, as he mentioned, it highlights the issue of the supply chain issues we're seeing in our country, the port congestion we're seeing in our country, and the work we're doing to truly understand what that means, um, our role in it from a safety and a security standpoint, but more importantly, what kind of additional risk is this introduced into our marine transportation system? Could that be a part of the oil spill, and how do we prevent uh, future accidents um, in the future? Uh, we are certainly focused on our future as well. And uh, into today, Admiral Walker talked about cyber. He talked about un unmanned systems. The auxiliary has a role here. Uh, I know that uh, we fly some unmanned aircraft. There's an auxiliary role here. And I think uh, you've been down in Florida at Station Island Morada. There's a big, big role there for the Coast Guard auxiliary. Uh, commercial space, offshore energy. And then as we're looking at data, we're entering a world that we're in an era, era of data and big data. And the Coast Guard is entering that world and uh, stood up a whole data office and, uh, and really looking at the possibilities there, which is, uh, which is endless. So I go on and on here for a long time, but I won't. Um, there is a lot going on uh, the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, both uh, domestically and both uh, globally. Um, and I would say because of this, uh, there will not just be a continuing role for the Coast Guard uh, Auxiliary. There will be a huge role for the Coast Guard Auxiliary. And we will rely on you as we always have. Admiral Mauger talked a little about cyber. And the work we're doing to uh, create an auxiliary cyber augmentation program, from my perspective, um, pretty darn exciting, right? Um, your work you do with uh, medical support, chaplaincy, interpreters, I got to tell you how noted that is, how front and center that is, and how uh, appreciated that work is. So um, as we enter this era, as we're in an era of Coast Guards, as we have a demand for our service has never been higher, both domestically and abroad, look forward to continue to work with you, support you, look forward to continue to see your contributions, um, look forward to working with Commodore Maluski and your leadership, leadership team to identify ways uh, that the Coast Guard can, uh, auxiliary and Coast Guard uh, can work together uh, as, as best as we can. And finally, let me just close out by saying uh, the most important thing I want to say, which is really thank you. Um, thank you for what you do each and every day. Um, some of these things are uh, large scale contingencies um, that are really, really important. Think about the oil spill and uh, off California that Admiral Mulder talked about. That was all over the national and international news. And we have a need for an interpreter so we can help understand maybe what happened with that event. There's auxiliary to provide that. Just, just can't thank you enough. But all the, uh, I would say, unsung heroes in the Coast Guard auxiliary that I've seen throughout my career, that are just there when you need them, looking, looking to help out in so many different ways. So again, thank you for your time today. Uh, thanks for what you do for our 
Um, great service, the world's best Coast Guard, and uh, thank you for, for your, your selfless service. Back to you, Terry. I said, I'm a Bushman. I'd like to thank you for your inspirational words. And I'd also like to thank you for not sharing any of your famous jokes with us. Uh, Mrs. Barth, I turn it over to you for some ground rules. And I certainly this and this pretty much everyone has already received them, but just to go over them. Uh, no virtual backgrounds. If you're not speaking, make sure you mute yourself. Um, when you're up to speak, if you have new information from what was sent out in your original three ups and downs or your ANACO comments, please indicate that it's new information. Those, uh, the compilation won't be sent out again, so people can update their own documents. Uh, this was just sent out so everyone could kind of follow along. Um, and other than that, Oh, you can, except when you're speaking, if you want to turn your webcams off, you can do that as well. Make sure they're on when you're speaking. And that's all I have. Okay, to that, I would like to add that uh, I request you be mindful of your allotted time. We have a very robust agenda and I'm sure that we want to have an opportunity to hear each of our directorates and the wonderful things they've accomplished. With that in mind, we're going to start us off with C, Computer Software and Systems, Director Amanda Constant. Amanda, you're up. Thank you, Commodore Fermato. Um, I'll just jump right in here and start with our achievements. The C Directorate staff discovered a breach of an internal database in late 2020. I'm sure you're well aware of that. The combined efforts of every division in the directorate enabled the join.cgox and the auxiliary applicant management system, known as AAMS, to be brought back into production on June 15th, 2021. Through this achievement, the auxiliary demonstrated expert vulnerability assessment, software rearchitecture, and penetration testing capabilities. The join AAMS web pages were rebuilt utilizing secure coding practices and an architecture that protects the internal databases by disallowing direct access from external sources. These new practices are being applied to other IT services through our ongoing re-architecture initiative. Our second achievement is the C Directorate has built an excellent working relationship between the Cybersecurity Division and CG Cyber and CG7, resulting in partnerships responding to incidents of mutual concern and constructing frameworks for an auxiliary cyber um, an aux cyber aug augmentation program. The cybersecurity division has expanded and now covers information assurance, cybersecurity education, incident response, policy engineering, testing, augmentation, and a CB CG cyber liaison officer with the active duty Coast Guard. The third item I'd like to share, the migration to the Amazon Web Services or AWS Cloud in late 2020 has enabled the directorate to improve IT services, server availability is improved with outages reduced to only a few minutes a month, all of which have auto-corrected without the need for manual intervention. The software engineering division, working with the IT operations and systems support division, has created a true test server, mirroring the production server, enabling live testing of code changes in a non-production environment prior to enablement and production. The combined teams are creating architectural diagrams and build documents, have built a tool enabling exports of National Test Center contact for the training directorate, and are collaborating with the training directorate on the release of a new auxiliary classroom Moodle server, coming soon. For challenges, the new server infrastructure is running higher than anticipated costs in the Amazon Web Services Cloud. This is due to the need for additional resources while applications and databases are moved from the previous single monolithic server design to more secure and cost-efficient resource cluster design. Current costs are monitored regularly via the Amazon Web Services cost op optimization tools and plans are in place to bring spend levels closer to the original estimates with steps already taken to reduce storage costs associated with service backup. And this is new information. Um, uh, to date, at the end of September, we had achieved a 22% reduction uh, from the previous high uh, monthly spend. Second challenge is around the joint AAMS. 
Um, this incident highlighted vulnerabilities in design and coding practices of our homegrown systems. Lessons learned from the resolution of these issues will be applied to other systems to make our overall cybersecurity posture stronger. And finally, the move to a completely new service cloud, Amazon Web Services, and the initiative to bring the auxiliary IT systems and services up to modern day standards and practices is resulting in changes across all aspects of the C directorate operations. Change management is an ongoing challenge as our organization grows, trains, and adapts to new processes. Thank you very much. And that's, I am done. Thank you, uh, Amanda. Next, I'd like to introduce to you, uh, Director Randy Patton, the Director of User Support. Randy, thrill. Thank you. Thank you, Commodore. Nice to see you. Nice to see everyone here. Even if it's virtually, we miss you. Um, I want to recognize my Deputy Director, Bob Fritz, who's somewhere here in the Hollywood Squares with us today. He does a terrific job, and I really appreciate him, and I want to call that out. Um, the first thing I'd like to share with you on the upside is I'm really pleased to report that our first virtual OX10 class for information services officers is about to be complete. We had a total of 25 students in the class. It went extremely well and the course will be repeated soon. It meets for two hours twice a week for seven weeks and covers the same material as the resident OX10 C school based on OX Data 2. We have a great instructional team working on that program. The second thing is that major editions of the OX Data 2 how-to guides have been published on the Information Technology Group website, and they've been very well received indeed by both information services officers and members alike. 20 such guides have now been published. Third, the one-click reports. Our outstanding team has completed and published a series of over 100 standardized one-click reports from OX Data 2 to provide members, flotillas, divisions, districts, and DIROX offices with ready access to data on member activities, qualifications, training status, awards, facility management, et cetera. The team continues to gather input from all levels of users uh, and also requested modifications to those reports already published. On the challenge side, number one, we had previously held some hopes that the OX Data 2 service request system might be able to completely replace our national help desk, which is aging. But since it clearly will not, and experience has shown us that, we are researching an alternative replacement for the help desk at this time. Secondly, our efforts to provide virtual training for communication services officers, informally known as OXWOW, has been an indefinite hold due to the high demands of OX Data 2 support and updating the OX 10 training material for OX Data 2. Now that our virtual IS officer course material is complete, our IT fellow can again focus his efforts on preparing OX while for deployment in the online training classroom. Thirdly, uh, it has been, and I just got a little notice here about a software update. Okay. Thirdly, that wasn't my third item, by the way. It has been an ongoing challenge to recruit qualified members, especially for our communication services officer support division. This is the team that reviews new and existing auxiliary websites on a rotating basis. That being said, the division chief and his team have done a great job in the past two months of bringing members on board. And we anticipate that once our Oxwell program is up and running, that'll serve to increase the talent pool from which we can recruit the staff. And with that, I thank you very much. And again, it's great to see you all. Thank you so much, Randy. It's now my honor to introduce to you the ANACO IT, Commodore Susan Davies. Commodore. Thank you, Commodore. And uh, it's like I, uh... Like Randy just said, it is so great to see all of you here today, even though it's virtual. Um, as you heard from Amanda and Randy, uh, there's a lot going on and they just touched the surface of what, uh, what they're working on together with uh, the deputies, Bob Fritz and Carlos Arenas that uh, Amanda uh, reminded me that I should mention to you. So it's a spectacular team great technical skill, great le leadership. And I just wanna give them a, a BZ, Bravo Zulu in public here. So thank you. What I'm gonna do today is 
just briefly go through where we are with the 10 uh, IT strategic milestones that are currently uh, uh, in progress or complete. We've got four out of 10 that are complete. Uh, the remainder are either uh, ongoing, uh, in process, one is partially complete. We had two that were previously on hold, but they are now in progress. So this is kind of a overall good news. So the first one is the server infrastructure project that the, uh, Amanda mentioned, and that was completed in December. But what that has allowed us to do as, we, as we've gotten used to how it works, we can see that there are opportunities to uh, kind of have a follow on milestone, two follow on milestones as it turns out, to take advantage of this new server infrastructure and make improvements to the overall security of the infrastructure. And so we've got two follow on milestones. One is to enhance the authentication uh, and uh, security around you know, how you log in. Uh, we'll probably at some point all have to change our passwords when that happens, just heads up, that's gonna happen. And then also a little bit of a redesign. Uh, you know, you never want to have all your eggs in one basket. So we want to take what's on the server and maybe start isolating. You know, put the websites without webmasters or WOW server component in its own little silo so that if anything ever happens to that, it doesn't affect everything else. The, the second milestone we have is to assist uh, uh, BSX office, uh, Captain Glendie's office, with updating the policy that we had in place with legacy ox data where information services officers were given guidance as to how they obtained what was called then read write capability into ox data. There are lots of requirements there and the DSOISs play a key role in recommending who should get that credential, if you will, air quotes. Uh, we need to update that policy now for the new ox data system where you don't have read write now anymore so much as you have um, uh, activity log approval permission. And so that policy draft is currently uh, under review with BSX and uh, I'm, I'm sure um, we'll be getting updates periodically over the next uh, couple of months or so as they work to finalize that. So it, Randy talked about uh, communication services a little bit. Um, we are currently updating that communication services, Ox Wow websites without webmasters course. And part of that milestone included recommending new communication services officer certifications. Well, that part is complete. Right now, we're not seeing the need to create new certifications for the CS officers like we have for the IS officers. But certainly what we would want to do is when the OxWow course is complete, that we want to give the participants credit for that. So we would create that as a completed task in OxData2, although that task doesn't necessarily lead to granting of a competency. It's just, hey, we want to give credit where credit is due and show that they've taken the course. So the next one, uh, the next milestone is a formal process to uh, review, approve, and prioritize requested enhancements to the auxiliary databases and services. Uh, Amanda mentioned the uh, auxiliary online classroom or air quotes Moodle as it's affectionately known. And C and T directorates have been working closely on bringing up the, the upgraded version of, of Moodle uh, first, we have to get the new authentication in place before that can happen. But that's an example of how we're working across directorates. Uh, but that has been a little bit ad hoc over the years. And so we're formalizing how directorates come into the C directorate to request uh, improvements in those services. Randy mentioned the information services officer course. It sounds like it's been tremendously successful this first out of, the, out of the shoot virtual CS or correction IS officer course with a new course content re to reflect Ox data too. That's been a heavy lift for Randy's team uh, and kudos go out to them uh, for what they have done. So 
partially complete in that curriculum content has been updated. Uh, we also have a, as a component of this milestone, updating the, as need be, the information services officer uh, credentials or qualifications or certifications. That's tied a little bit to that DSX policy memo that I mentioned earlier. So that part is on hold as we continue to work with BSX on updating that ox data uh, authorization permission policy. As Randy mentioned, uh, we looked at ox data um, as a replacement for the Kayako help desk system that we have, the service, and it's just not going to work out. It's um, it's difficult to access from the from the public, and we need a public component because the public does come in with questions like, "Hey, I've lost my voter safety course certificate. How can I replace it? My loved one passed away. What do I do with their uniforms?" all sorts of questions like that. Um, there are potential email reply issues, lack thereof, from Oxdata to back to those uh, folks who submit help desk requests. So um, we've completed that milestone in that we've assessed Oxdata and said, no, it's not gonna work. So the follow on milestone is now to go out and search for a, a properly developed uh, help desk software that we can use. And I think we've narrowed it down to about three candidates. I uh, won't go into details here, but that, that follow on milestone is already in progress. We've completed a cybersecurity risk assessment of the auxiliary's uh, national web presence um, and to include WOW. And that report is about to be completed. So I'm calling that one complete, uh, a follow on uh, milestone will be to take a look at that report, see what we want to accept, not accept, put you know push off till later, and then start prioritizing. And we need to bring in um, kind of a sense of does anything here have a cost to it? Um, is is there anything that uh, needs to happen before it, before another aspect is uh, started? So kind of a sequential approach. So that's the next step. Read the report uh, as need be, bring recommendations forward to Nexcom and, and proceed from there. The next one is uh, evaluate uh, auxiliary process workflows, if you will, paper-based mission and member activity forms. Basically this one is what do we do today that could be done in Oxdata to maybe more efficiently? Now that one is due in December. That's um, my lead right now. Um, so far, to be honest, uh, Oxdata 2 can be a little bit unwieldy. We had a grand vision for Oxdata 2 to help with efficiency, but it can be a little bit unwieldy to design a workflow into it and have it well understood and have it have a workflow not break something else so i'm a little bit skeptical about this one but hey it's not december yet so we'll see uh, second to last one we're going to look at uh, migrating homegrown databases and services such as the national testing center into maybe commercial or open source software i think we're looking at possibly moving ntc into moodle but uh, i won't go too much further in that and so we'll provide recommendations to Nexcom on what we want to do with that. And last but not least, uh, every three weeks, I participate in a configuration advisory board uh, with the Coast Guard for Oxdata 2 uh, changes. And I want to put a, a shout out to the districts who have been so great in vetting and submitting vetted proposals to the tier one team on the uh, Oxdata 2 service uh, request side. They vet those feature requests. They bring them to the configuration advisory board where that board takes a look, sees what is uh, accepted and viable to be placed in Oxdata and it is given to Acumen the vendor and they design it, we test it and push it to production. Just most recently, uh, Tina Perry out of D11 North provided us with a proposal to, uh, hey, wouldn't it be nice if a member offering a facility for use 
was notified when the OTO operations training officer had approved that facility. So yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing like positive reaction on that one. And so we're we're just now working with Acumen on uh, designing that email. There are kind of lots of points in the workflow that we need to make sure don't trigger that email. Just wait till the end when the OTO has approved it. So that's just an, one of many examples. So that, that's all I have from the A Acre IT shop. Commodore, I'd like to thank you and your teams for the amazing work you're doing. Thank you so very much. Thank you. We are doing a lot, a lot on the plate, but it's fun. Thanks again. Okay, so that brings us to Director of M of Measurements, Kevin Redden. Kevin. Good afternoon, Commodore. Uh, performance measurement has been busy. When Aux Data One shut down last year, it also shut down our capability of doing any reports. So we've had a major project to reconstitute the reports, building them from Aux Data Two. We have now completed that. Uh, so all of the old reports have been reconstituted and now we're bringing new ones online. One of the reports that uh, we had in the past and have now is the ITRM report, the Introduction to Risk Management. That report in the past listed everybody who was required to have it, and that means all elected offices and a good number of the appointed offices, and then showed their status. In other words, that report was huge. With We have now gotten to the point where 98% of all members who require ITRM have it. So we've retooled the report. So now we're only showing who is required to have it and does not. In other words, we brought it down from tens of th thousands of lines to 184 lines. So it's a uh, much easier to use report and giving good information to the elected leadership. Second up is our election eligibility report. We publish that quarterly from January through August, but come September 1st, we switch that over to weekly publication to allow the election cycle to have uh, very current information right through the end of the year. Since we did that on September 1st, we've had well over 700 downloads. In other words, all the divisions and flotillas are pulling that report. Uh, the last up is the unit summary data report. That was one of the most useful reports in Aux Data 1, and of course that ceased at that time. So performance measurement has now built a uh, unit summary report. And that report, by the way, is a snapshot in time. So when you look at it, you're seeing the number of auxiliaries in each status and the number of pilots, number of boat crew at the point where the report was made. In a lot of cases, we're asked, well, how does that compare to last month or six months ago? So we're archiving those on the M website. So not only can you find the current one, but you can look six months back, you can look a year back, uh, you know, whatever reports you need. Okay, as, as far as downs, um, given the large number of report deliverables that we have, uh, putting these out has become a challenge. So some recent staffing additions along with a new scheduling tool uh, have helped uh, considerably on that. Second down is we found problems with data migration anomalies with making sure we have accurate data. So we've come up with fixes to make sure we're getting accurate data because if we're gonna put something out on one of reports, it has to be good. Uh, the last down is that while some of our reports such as the election eligibility, uh, all the flotillas out there know about it and are using it. Some of our other reports are, have a rather low hit rate. So it's incumbent upon us to get the word out to the field about this. And we're working on uh, communication uh, systems in order to get the field better informed. And that's what I got, Commodore, back to you. Kevin, thank you so very much for uh, creating, maintaining, and distributing these necessary reports. Genuinely appreciate it. Thank you. So next, that will bring us up to the Deputy Director of Student Programs, Jacob Thayer. Jacob? 
Good afternoon, Commodore. Thank you so much. And good afternoon to everyone else. I'm Jacob Thayer. I'm the Deputy Director of Student Programs. And together with Jean Marie McNamara, we oversee Auxiliary University Programs and the Youth Programs Division, or Aux Scout, which manages our relationship with the Sea Scouts Program. I want to start with our challenges and then end on a positive note. So the first challenge that we are experiencing and we're already remedying is we're working to understand how many Sea Scouts are actually joining the auxiliary through the Aux Scout program. We've seen tremendous growth in flotillas chartering ships and students are joining those ships in large numbers. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. And now we wanna see how many are actually coming all the way over to the auxiliary and hopefully bringing their parents with them. Um, Commodore Davies and the IT directorates and, and BSX have been very helpful and providing us with the capability to do that. And now we're just putting our data in or having people put their data in to get better information out. Our second challenge is a challenge that's probably affected everybody on this call and that's COVID. Um, our auxiliary university programs team relies on students being at college campuses. Without students going to college campuses and going to org fairs, it's difficult to recruit new students. Um, students are starting to go back this year in, in greater numbers. So we're starting to see the fog lift there. And also our Aux Scout program has experienced some districts' reticence to enable them to operate or to start new programs while we're muddling our way through kind of the COVID experience too. We're starting to see the fog lift there too, but that is that has been a challenge for us, like I'm sure everyone else. We also had a couple of key staffers leave AUP this summer. Typically the summer for AUP is a, an opportunity to strategically think about what the year ahead looks like and plan and, and grow the program. So we were a little softer in planning than we wanted to be this year, um, but we're excited to in, uh, introduce Commodore Chuck Miracle now as our new division chief for AUP. And we're also making some strategic structural changes to improve continuity, knowing that eventually everybody here in the auxiliary is going to leave their position rather planned or unplanned. And so we want to be ready for constant, constant movement. Um, we're also going to be looking to bridge tighter connections with active duty components that have natural synergies to the program too. And we're hoping that that'll bring some vibrancy and consistency as well. So here's what's going well in student programs. Like I mentioned a moment ago, Aux Scout is growing exceptionally. It's just seen exponential growth in such a short period of time. We have 21 auxiliary chartered Sea Scout ships with over 270 Sea Scouts in 11 districts. So like I said, we have seen just tremendous growth there and we're seeing even more that it's harder to calculate because other ships that aren't attached to auxiliary units are still partnering kind of ad hoc at a local basis with auxiliary flotillas. So we know that the numbers of interactions are much higher than just what we are sponsoring. Um, to that end, Bruce Johnson and his team have created a, a tremendous public affairs presence and they have a Facebook group with over 1200 members just for the Aux Scout program. So highly encourage if you're interested in the program to, to check that out. Our AUP internship and graduation rates have been strong and on target with uh, historical numbers notwithstanding COVID. So we're excited to see that. We're excited to see students still getting commissioned at a rate higher than civilians walking in off the street with no Coast Guard experience. So that's fantastic too. To make that even better, we are improving our program of study to foster some greater diversity. So what that looks like is enabling technical school students and graduate students to be able to join the program. And this will go to specifically support Coast Guard strategic needs, things to fill critical rates, whether it be on the enlisted side or, or critical officer specialties too. We're incorporating more qualifications, things like cybersecurity, emergency management, Coast Guard operations, and some other leadership courses. So we're excited to see what the team over there will be doing over the coming months and years. And finally, another thing we'd like to highlight is the Aux Scout's Strong STEM program. They have a YouTube channel for Aux Scout. Again, another great resource I highly recommend anybody interested checking out. It's got over 60 STEM and other training workshops available real time on it. Um, so a real bravo Zulu to Bruce Johnson and his team over there. They've even partnered with the Coast Guard Research and Development Center to have a STEM, a, excuse me, a STEM research and development competition for students who are putting forth recommendations for Coast Guard needs. It's been a great experience in the first year and we're looking to continue that years ahead. 
Um, to that end, we've also sent several Sea Scouts to the Coast Guard Academy's introduction mission, their summer program for students looking at the academy, and put several students underway on the Eagle over the summer too. So they're making some great uh, centers with the active duty components that we're excited to see. Um, Gene and I just want to thank the team and S for doing such great work, uh, especially Bruce Johnson for leading the Ox Scout team and Jim Stevens, who was our previous division chief for AUP. We're excited to see what Chuck Miracle is going to do. Um, everybody on the team's made it easy to do our jobs, and uh, we here in S are ready to connect with anybody who'd like to learn more about our programs or get involved. So thank you so much, Commodore Formato, and everyone else. Jacob, uh, thank you to you and the team. Great job despite the challenges you faced. You never wavered, never faltered. You pressed forward. And for that, we are truly, truly grateful. Okay, with that, I have the honor of introducing Commodore Peter Jensen, a NACO for performance and student programs. Peter. You're he still muted? muted? He's still muted? Yes, sir. Okay. Hopefully, he could hear us. Peter Jensen? Sorry, 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 I was muted. Um, you know, just this morning, somebody asked me over coffee, uh, do you ever have any trouble sleeping? I said, with directors and deputy directors like mine, I sleep through the night, no problem at all. Um, the um, to get to the strategic plan first, the student programs director has made good progress towards their strategic plan items. I'll pass lightly over what's been done and, and focus, focus on what remains. Uh, they've actually finished two thirds of their milestones to date and the rest are on track. And uh, in the bullpen to be completed is um, to summarize an, an outreach of AUP to, um, uh, to, uh, to university, auxiliary reserve and active duty commanders. And with all of that entails, including the public, uh, including a um, working with our own public affairs directorate and diversity directorate, the uh, diversity group, pardon me, to make this happen. Uh, we also would like to get a better grip on the on the social media presence, um, and uh, this is uh, we'll need some help. Um, uh, we'll need some help with uh, technical and ownership issues, uh, at, which we're getting. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put, I hope to put that to bed uh, uh, as, as we head into 2022. Uh, finally, the, the, we're interested in developing and deploying public service announcements and um, also to uh, include Ox Scout achievements into the AUP program and study that goes to cross pollination. And indeed, uh, Oh, there, there's no reason why Ox, uh, Ox Scout students can't move on, move into AUP. It's a natural segue if you think about it. The number of them, I suspect, will. Well, we've heard from the folks in the Performance Measurement Directorate, and they've crafted some several powerful data visualization and data analysis products uh, for the auxiliary's national, district, local echelons, and for BSX. And finally, despite COVID, both the Auxiliary University program and the Ox Scout program, they're growing in size, they're broadening in focus, both have a promising future. And that's all I have. I will yield the rest of my time to our friends on the ARP side. Commodore, thank you and your team so very much for the uh, amazing work that you're doing, uh, and please continue. All right, so that brings us to our first break. So 15 minutes, so why don't we say 14, 25 hours, we rejoin each other. 14, 25 hours, thank you. Okay, you are good, uh, Linda. Um,
So welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope you missed me as much as I missed you. Moving on with our program brings me to the Director of International Affairs, David Wang. David, I know that Rear Admiral Morgan and Vice Admiral Bushman may have borrowed, they don't steal, may have borrowed a little bit of your thunder, but I'm sure you have quite a bit more to share with us. Please do so. Thank you, Commodore. Yes, they did steal a little bit of thunder, but we are in a storm, so there's plenty to go around. Um, my name is David Huang. I'm the Director of International Affairs. International Affairs has been very busy supporting the activity in all their major national and international missions in, for the past year. Um, we'll start with the Interpreter Corps. Um, we recently deployed a Russian interpreter from Ohio all the way to Alaska for Arctic patrols in a C-130. And he was, that was in support of Operation Arctic Shield, um, where we um, engaged, the, the aircraft engaged Russian military and, and naval forces um, on patrol. We also were involved with Afghan refugee relocation. Our Dari interpreter um, assisted Department of Homeland Security, State Department and White House in the translation of documents. And this is new information that's not on your sheets, which is we also were in uh, involved in um, the southern border mi migrant crisis. We provided Portuguese interpreter on a 24 hour watch basis for over two weeks to assist the border patrol and DHS with interpretation services. We were involved in Hurricane Ida um, with Creole interpreters. We were involved in the Haiti earthquake um, with interpreters. Um, and as you know, we were involved in the oil spill in California by providing a Croatian interpreter to deploy onto the vessel with the boarding team. Our interpreter, that's just a, some of the missions they were, they've been on. Other interpreter missions, including Russian, Chinese, Turkish, Vietnamese interpreters assisting vessels in need, international not notice, notification of kin, um, Mexican notifications um, were, were um, done. There's too, too numerous to, to mention. Um, our Spanish Russian interpreters were interpreting for numerous conferences for the Coast Guard as well as the Department of Defense. So um, Interpreter Corps has been extremely busy. Now, while we're mostly known for the Interpreter Corps, we have an international outreach team who are just as active. In the past year, the team has outreached to 42 nations across the, the globe, and we have planned the largest international presence ever at an ACON. Unfortunately, that didn't come through due to COVID, but we had a great attendance from our international partners. International Outreach also assisted Coast Guard International Affairs with a strategic paper for the National Security Council. Now, we're always looking for opportunity to present the auxiliary in a good light, so we suggested language on how the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary could play a role in the Department of Defense Inter-Pacific Inter Command Regional Strategy, and that was accepted by the Active Duty Coast Guard and included in the documents of the National Security Council. In addition to that, we're working on memo, memorandum of understandings, MOUs with the nation of Tonga and recently the nation of Venezuela. So those are just some of the things that the international outreach group is working on. Now onto my downs. Um, we don't have the budget to have more meaningful engagements with foreign partners. Um, because the Commandant strategy in the Pacific region, it is vitally important that um, the auxiliary as a soft diplomacy arm of the Coast Guard, um, make these connections with the nations that the Coast Guard wants to engage in in the South Pacific. So having meaningful engagements um, would be very important. Also, we are in desperate need of language, in, um, Chinese, Russian, Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese interpreters. And we're, we're looking to have a, a recruitment strategy at the district level to outreach into the um, outreach into the districts where we would um, engage with um, regional um, chambers of commerce support groups to get these interpreters into the auxiliary to help us with these language needs. So that pretty much wraps up what's going on in international affairs. Thank you very much. David, thank you. The work you and your team are doing is just absolutely amazing. And as you know, I'm a huge proponent of uh, targeted recruiting. So hopefully that bears fruit for you. 
With that, I would like to introduce you to Director of Prevention, Kim Cole. Kim. Hi, right, thank you. Well, prevention, we are working very hard right now on our strategic plan items. Um, in our three ups and downs, we have mentioned about the commercial vessel division. They have completed their updating of their UPV PQS, the Uninspected Passenger Vessel Workbook. And in working with the previous ANACO and our current ANACO, we realized that we really would like to see that become standardized under the Coast Guard formatting of the workbook. So we have sent that back to them to have them update the formatting and get that in line with all other workbooks that we are doing. We're doing the same with other workbooks as well. And as part of our strategic plan, we picked five different workbooks to start with, and we are change, updating those and we are changing the formatting over to mirror the active duties formatting in their workbooks as well. So all will be under the same standardized format once it's complete. We uh, are working on five study guides for these particular workbooks. And we are just about complete with all those. They are being handed over to the proofreader that we have now on our team. And once she has completed checking these over, then we will be happy to send them up the chain and have that process started on getting those approved as well. Um, many people don't realize they've been working on several PowerPoint presentations. We have some that we have posted online now. Those are in regards to the commercial uh, vessel division. We also have one for sea partners that we have just recently completed. We have not sent that up the chain as yet, but uh, our new branch chief did a fantastic job on that. And I'm looking forward to people being able to see that presentation. We're working to be able to draw more interest into the sea partner program. This is an extremely important mission for the auxiliary and for the Coast Guard as well. It gives us good public interest. Uh, it, it puts a very good light on our, on our area. Sea Partners actually talks to the public about pollution, water pollution, and what we can do, do to try to help with the problems. And we're looking to get more and more people involved. Obviously with COVID, that was one of our downs is a lot of our hours were greatly, or excuse me, greatly reduced because of the COVID restrictions. Our people mainly work directly with the Coast Guard and obviously we were not able to get into the sectors and the stations during many of the restrictions. Now with it starting to loosen up now, we're starting to see more and more hours starting to build again. And when, if you look into the report, you'll see our, our sea partner hours has uh, started increasing quite a bit. So we're very proud of the fact that we're getting a lot more people involved with sea partners and seeing more things happening. We look to find greater interest and a lot more happening within that mission as we go along. The, um, we, on the other strategic plan items that we have, as I said, many of those are already at our proof, in our proofreader's hands. So many of those you should, should start seeing going up the chain very shortly. And uh, that is pretty much what we have accomplished. We, I think I really give a lot of credit to my staff. They are doing fantastic work. They put out a lot of good effort. And thank you. Grateful for you, your team, and all that they do. Very important uh, aspect of auxiliary life is prevention. Okay, next we have Q. And Q is kind of misleading because Q actually stands for Emergency Management and Disaster Response. With that, Commodore Bob Tepet. Commodore? Thank you, sir. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're right now working uh, or have completed the first 22 emergency management qualifications or competencies uh, that are, have been added to and, and inputted into OxData 2. It's just the first step of uh, towards the competencies tracking uh, our auxiliary emergency management uh, qualifications and, and truly getting a handle on for the first time the, the, the actual number of people we have that are working in emergency management. Uh, we have a lot of people have a lot of qualifications, but uh, a limited number of those are certified by the Coast Guard, which is one of the one of the main steps that we have to have. 
The Auxiliary Situational Awareness Dashboard was created during or prior to the hurricane season and is operational and utilized effectively to roll up situational information and reporting from the district level during uh, several events to include Hurricane Ida. And what the dashboard does, and I've had a lot of directors call and ask that I, I get copied on the same information that's going to senior management. And the answer to that is go to the dashboard. The dashboard is, is listed on the uh, Q Directorate website. It provides information to senior management on a uh, timely basis. It's updated daily. Uh, we have a duty officer who manages that, that operation. And we in, uh, really, really would like to have a lot of people go and, and visit that site when we have things going on. We track both uh, Hurricane Ida and uh, a number of the wildfires this year. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been a significant amount of work that was put into it by their uh, response division. And uh, they've done a super job. The directorate uh, participated in a task uh, group which developed the new emergency management specialist PQS, which will eventually replace the auxiliary assistant contingency planner PQS and bring auxiliary emergency management qualifications in line with the rest of the Coast Guard. This is a major undertaking uh, that was done uh, with uh, by the division chief of uh, contingency planning, and they've done a super job. Our downs are NACON uh, cancellation uh, caused us to have a delay in our training process. The uh, DSOEMs were uh, coming to uh, NACON uh, at the expense of uh, CGOEM, who was, who was fording the, the funding to, uh, so we could do that. And that was end of year funds and they're not available for end train. So right now there's uh, not, not gonna be the training that we'd hope. So we're working on right now, putting it into a virtual format and uh, still getting the, the training accomplished. The ongoing pandemic impact on auxiliary EM qualifications and training is not really known because we just, <clears throat> don't have a true level of being able to track uh, the uh, capabilities of, of the training aspects in Ox Data 2, but that's being resolved rather quickly as we move along. And the Q Director continues to uh, wait resolution and fixes to the Everbridge program. Uh, there is a, a problem in transferring the data information uh, electronically from Everbridge, I mean, uh, from uh, Ox Data 2 to Everbridge. Uh, it's done now manually, and uh, keep, uh, we try to keep up with it as, uh, as quickly as we can uh, when uh, we have changes that need to be put into Everbridge. And with that, sir, I, I, I yield the rest of my time. Commodore, thank you so very much. That brings us up to the Director of Response, Roy Savoka. Thank you, Commodore. First, I'd like to say that the Response Directorate has been very busy this last year. A number of items are in the hopper up with BSX and should be approved and policy letters going out shortly. So over the next three months, we might see quite a bit more coming out. First thing, Hurricane Ida, we received an urgent request for push to talk capabilities. Um, the telecom team very quickly polished up and put the finishing touches on a best practices that they have been working on, sent it out. Um, one of the nice things about push to talk especially a standardized push to talk. It allows people from district, different districts to talk with each other. And another very important feature of it 
it does not affect the cell system. So first responders and everybody else are not being affected by what we're doing. Um, everybody was very happy with it. We provided four members for six days, 24 hours a day. They stood shifts, helping out with any communication problems that occurred. Also with Hurricane Ida, we had two aircraft positioned in Mobile. We flew a total of 10 missions for 21.6 hours ferrying uh, personnel and supplies back and forth. New, fresh people going in, tired people coming out. We released the fall responder. And what's so important about what we did there is we had a SAR in Maui where we found a paddle boarder, the aviation folks, on a first light search, mostly because the woman had given her daughter a float plan. Here's where I'm going. Here's what my board looks like. Here's what I'm wearing. So they, they got to her very quickly. And what the crew said was she was beginning to look a little, uh, a little the worse for wear by the time they got there. Our crew, um, directed a helicopter to rescue her a, and a cutter to, um, to go and pick up her, her board in addition to the fact that we found her. We were able to write an article which we published in the responder. We also got it in um, the National What's New thanks to the folks in the A directorate and we were able to get that article published in Homeland Security Today. And what's important about it being there, it tells people this is what we do. And our long-term hope, part of our strategic plan is that people will read this article and say, hey, that I can do something like that. Maybe I should look into this Coast Guard auxiliary thing and see about becoming a member. So without recruiting, we're recruiting. The last thing we had submitted and had approved a new plan for AUX-18. Uh, we submitted it and COVID said, ha, we'll see, we'll see what we can do to you. Anyway, um, within the last week, we reevaluated what had been approved for AUX-18. At the same time, we looked into AUX-17, which is a, it's an auxiliary taught um, Coast Guard class, but it has to be in person. That's dictated by, by the Coast Guard and quite a number of those were canceled. And we were very fearful of a lot of our crews going REYR. So we rewrote uh, both AUX-17, AUX-18, and we figured, you know, if we're having this much of a problem on the aviation side, we should probably take a look at what's going on on the, um, on the surface side and found that in particular, hours, minimum hours were were a problem. A lot of people were not able to get their hours for a variety of reasons, mostly COVID related. So included in our plan is something to help out the surface folks too. That also concludes my downs because the down was COVID hit us pretty hard. That's all I have for today. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Roy. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to all the amazing things that your team has accomplished. And you know what I was saying? That when the call comes, you were there to answer the call. Well, your phone must have been ringing off the hook because the call came many times over and over for your teams. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Okay, that will bring us 
to the ANACO RP, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to Commodore Rick Saunders. Rick? Hello, Rick. Rick, you're muted. Unmute yourself. Still mute it. Can you do sign language? When you have two monitors going, it's hard getting the mouse back and forth. All righty. Hello, Rick Saunders, ANACO Response and Prevention. So within the group, as you know, in addition to response prevention, we also have international affairs, emergency management, and disaster response. Within the strategic plan, all of the directorates, except for emergency management, collectively have 38 milestones, or 30% of all the current elements. Over 21 of these milestones are completed, so we have a current completion rate of about 55%. While some of the milestone dates have slipped, all are expected to be completed. Rather than presenting the status of each milestone, it's almost too much data, and it's reported on a tracking report, I'll highlight some of the areas of focus and progress. Overall, if you look at these, there's a common thread among many of these milestones. They look to improve the safety, professionalism, and proficiency of our members. Tied to that is availability. Key to availability is attracting more members and facilities to get involved in these mission areas. Another key element is to build upon our working relationship with the active duty partners through increased knowledge of our capabilities. First of all, looking at response. Response was tasked with strengthening the auxiliary relevance to local Coast Guard units. They currently have 15 milestones with seven completed. One of their major goals was to develop best practices for enhancing and maintaining an ongoing relationship between auxiliary air programs, OxAir, and the active duty air station. Working with district, division, air station staff, significant progress is made to achieving that goal. And while it wasn't an initial element of the strategic plan, the need for additional information was identified. Surveys were developed and sent out to every Coast Guard air station and all current Ox Air members. The goal of the survey was really twofold. Identify for each station the specific air missions. What do they need? What do they need more of? Second was to understand the perceptions of the value and strength of Ox Air. Survey isn't completed. We're still waiting for surveys back from some of the air stations, but there's some interesting initial findings. If you look at the question, does Ox Air meet air station needs? The active duty replied that Ox Air exceeds their needs over 40% of the time. Ox Air members rated that at 11%. Looking at the importance of Ox Air to air station operations, the air stations replied at over 80% that it was either critical or very important. Ox Air members rated themselves at 53% in the same category. Many of the other results had similar indices. This to me indicates the known value of the program and more significantly, the desire of the members to do more and to do it better. Building on these findings, the program is being built to provide the tools and best practices to even better integrate and support the air stations. In telecommunications, the need is for additional better trained resources to better support the active duty. Working with the district staff officers, as well as highlighting member activities within the telecommunication progress is being made in this area. Telecommunications by its very nature is technology driven. With an updated TCO or telecommunication operator PQS is being finalized, as well as an enhanced workshop planned for next year. The team is working to improve the training and proficiency of members in this area. Surface operations were tasked with increasing the proficiency and professionalism operation members to improve mission safety and effectiveness. 
Recently, a group of drill sheets was provided to give our crews a valuable tool to aid them in trading for greater proficiency. One of their milestones was updating of all of the surface PQS, PQSs. With a goal of updating the requirements and as much as possible, mirroring the active duty qualifications. Realizing we're not the active duty, language and formatting will be mirrored as much as possible and some tasks being modified to more closely align with the active duty. Frankly, while this project was delayed, uh, now working with Master Chief Park, our new operations band, branch chief at BSX, the project is making significant progress. We added staff to work with the chief qualification examiner and OXAIR instructor pilots flight examiner liaisons to improve proficiency and safety. We had some staffing changes that presented, prevented a, as full a rollout of the program as we were hoping for. I'm confident we're now staffed and we'll get this back on track. Prevention. Prevention has tasked two major groupings of milestones. Foster an auxiliary wide prevention focus. Really, it's the promotion and training. Second, the updating of PQSs. They currently have 14 milestones with three completed. A significant component of prevention efforts has been to update auxiliary performance qualification standards to mirror that active duty PQS, to reflect the training of the members that are receiving a letter of designation for these qualifications. Coupled with this is development of study guides for many of the PQSs. The majority, as Kim had said, of these PQSs and study guides are completed and are in final review and final formatting. A lot of these PQSs, the title included the word assistant. We're probably gonna be stopping to use that word in the actual naming of the PQS at the request of the active duty. In many of these qualifications, the auxiliarist helps and works with the active duty and the active duty qualifies them. Making the PQS more closely mirror what the active duty is familiar with and using aids in the qualification process and presents the member as really more a member of Team Coast Guard. A presentation of how and why members can get involved in prevention in the C partners is in final review. We need to reinvigorate this program. Coupled with this is training on how to adequately or correctly record hours in this mission area. More is being done than being recorded. To help build in the future, they've created a prevention outreach for use by the Auxiliary University program and are finalizing one for Sea Scouts that reflects the limits within the memorandum of understanding. These presentations are meant to show and promote what the members of the university program Sea Scouts can contribute within the prevention field. PowerPoints reflecting the orientation and refresher for unexpected passenger vessels commercial fishing vessels, using these pre presentations to attract more members to become qualified in one or both of these qualifications. Both of these qualifications are listed on high need on the gap analysis for prevention. The team is also updating the introduction to marine safety and environmental protection online course. This IMSEP is very outdated and needs to reflect current information training and standards for the Coast Guard. International Affairs was tasked with expanding the Auxiliary Interpreter Corps augmentation and strengthen the auxiliary relevance to local Coast Guard units. All nine of their milestones have been completed. The strategic plan elements for International Affairs encompass two primaries, primary areas. First was to work with Coast Guard International Affairs to ensure consistency with countries on the DCOI's engagement list, as well as to establish support for each combatant command region. The goal is to ensure our international outreach to other auxiliary organizations supports the area of focus to the Coast Guard. The team was restructured to align with Coast Guard combatant commands regions and to provide better support. During this process, the Indo-PACCOM and AFRICOM areas 
were identified as strong areas of focus for the team, important to the Coast Guard. Another area of strategic play and focus for international is to identify and work with district champions to develop and implement plans for recruiting to meet the needs identified in the gap analysis, high need languages. The team has already been presenting over the last few weekends, um, targeted recruiting plans to the districts, working with them to develop those best practices, targeted marketing efforts to the international teams. Our international outreach has dramatically increased. As David had mentioned this year at Macon, we had delegations from Philippines, Korea, Japan, Dominican Republic, Bahamas, Sweden, and Caraco. This would have been the largest international representation with three countries actually planning to send active duty officers to our meeting. In closing, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the hard work of all of the group's directors and their staffs. While the completion of the strategic plan is of critical importance to the auxiliary, it no way represents everything this group accomplishes. Thank you. Commodore, thank you and thank your teams. The amazing amount that you've accomplished is just so admirable. Thank you. And that will bring us to the director B, Boating Outreach, Chris Wilson. Hello, thank you, Commodore, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, you know, this, this uh, pandemic has really taught us anything. It's taught us that we need to adapt, we need to change the way we do things. And if it I'm so thankful for my deputy director, Nan Ellen Fuller, and the great staff. Uh, we've accomplished many great things. Uh, so first on the positive and upside, uh, the district liaison division, they're reporting that there's a substantial uptick in the amount of public education in all four of our regions. The auxiliary is coping with the COVID, variant and challenges limiting face-to-face -face contact. Where permitted, the response has been many more flotillas conducting either an increased number of smaller classes or virtual. Uh, the second one from the RBS Outreach Liaison Division. Uh, we have an MOA with the National Safe Boating Council signed by all parties and is currently at BSX. In, in, in addition, the division reached out to the International Marine Electronics Alliance and the National Marine Electronics Association for future MOEs. The Paddlecraft Safety Division reports the Paddlecraft uh, Safety Division has been very active during the summer of 2021. We've seen a strong growth in the program, both in the auxiliary participation and the outreach to the paddling community. Staff's reporting shows about 10 aux pad operators and qualifiers providing shore training to at least 45 auxiliarists and on water training to at least 60 auxiliarists. The same group has direct contact with at least 300 paddlers if this trend continues, there's no reason it won't. We expect to reach 1,800 paddlers next year and more than 10,000 the year after that. Uh, from the Communication Service Division, another edition of RBS Job One is in the works. Uh, in addition, we have an excellent social media presence uh, where we are getting several thousand likes and follows every day uh, on the RBS Facebook page. Uh, so if you haven't joined that, please do. Um, great information there. Uh, the website updates have also added uh, the M MOUs and MOAs that the auxiliary has established with our RBS partners. Um, <clears throat> Now for our challenges, because I don't like to use the word downs, 
the paddle craft safety division uh, is reporting a lack of a coherent flotilla to national leadership structure in the paddle craft safety area, which creates pockets of activity instead of a unified command. This lack of a coherent national structure inhibits growth of the program. Lack of the coherent flotilla to national structure makes it a challenge to identify what the auxiliary paddlecraft safety specialists are doing. For this report, we are able to get feedback describing the activity of about 10 people. However, we know that many more are active, which means the contact numbers provided here are very conservative and might be underreported under activity uh, by the order of magnitude. We need to create a formal organizational structure for paddlecraft safety, including DSOs, ADSOs, SOs, and FSOs. Also from the paddlecraft safety division, the size of the AUXPAD community, although we have seen significant growth in the past year, the program is quite small, with pockets of activity widely separated from each other. Strong support from the auxiliary and active Coast Guard leadership is needed to grow this community and better serve craft that contribute to roughly a quarter of all boating deaths. Uh, Commodore, that's all I have. Chris, thank you so very much. Uh, obviously, you and your team have been uh, up to quite a bit and accomplishing quite a bit. And we'll see what we can't do about mitigating uh, your challenge. Thank you. So that brings us to the Director of Public Education, Dave Fuller. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning if uh, you're a little bit further to the west. And uh, for our friends out in um, uh, the far uh, Pacific, uh, I guess it's good morning on Monday morning there, if, I'm, if my calculations are correct. I know we have some folks in Singapore and in Guam. So hello to all of you as well. So I'm here and I'm exceptionally proud to represent the education directorate to you today on behalf of the entire team. We could not deliver what we promised without a very talented and dedicated group of shipmates, each with their own responsibilities. But I must single out our leadership team of Bob Brandenstein, our deputy director, and the division chiefs, Karen Miller, Greg Fonzino, Commodore Mike Morris, Dan Stroop, and our special advisor and trusted friend, Commodore Clark Godshall. They are the locomotive engine that pulls this train down the track. They truly make the impossible possible with their innovative ideas turned into actions, which result in the highest quality products and support for those products. Individually, the leadership team members are all uniquely talented, but together the team delivers far more together than any could do individually, as teamwork is the secret sauce of our directorate. We know our customers are the flotillas, and our mission is to give them the tools, the materials, the training, and encouragement to go out and make a difference in recreational boating safety. So I'm excited to share a few of our successes and our challenges with you today. So I'll begin with the successes. First, all seven RBS strategic milestones assigned to the education director have been completed, and we developed two additional strategic initiatives for 2022 that were facilitated by data-driven decisions. Our leadership team meets weekly, and the entire directorate team meets monthly to discuss the strategic initiatives and to gather feedback. This team sets the bar for responsiveness to the districts with one-on-one -on -one help and training in addition to the quarterly meetings with the district's chiefs of staff and the district staff officers for public education. Number two, continuous improvement of our course and seminar offerings is our standard. Our current priority projects include personal watercraft and an update to boating skills and seamanship. Communications have improved with feedback from instructors nationally, helping to shape our planning of public education courses and seminars. 
One example of action resulting from feedback received, including conversion of several courses and seminars into the Spanish language. A second example is developing a priority for which specific modules of BSNS would be most utilized by flotillas and therefore first on our list of improvements. State conformance approvals for Boat America require nearly continuous personal contact with individual state boating law administrators. These approvals continue to come in gradually through NASBA. This critical work is exceptionally time consuming for our course development division chief who continues to doggedly pursue those approvals. Number three, doing our part to contribute to a renewed culture of safety in the auxiliary, we developed a po and posted a classroom safety checklist on our website for public education classroom safety best practices. This will be refined and improved as we learn more from our instructors giving us additional feedback. So now the challenges. First and most importantly, the, the recent rise in recreational boating fatalities underscores the need for an even greater emphasis on widely available public boating education. At a time when our instructors were most critically needed, Workshop Not Complete, which is REWK status, has been set for more than one third of our qualified instructors because of failure to complete and record the annual workshop. This seriously degrades our readiness to deliver public education and member training. As many flotillas begin to ramp up classes coming off COVID restrictions, we are left with critically fewer resources to, de to deliver education and member training. As of mid-July 2021, we experienced a reduction of 1,152 qualified instructors. I communicated this issue with the district chiefs of staff and the district staff officers for public education so they could address this issue with their affected members. Number two, a select handful of states have not responded or are, or are very slow to respond to NASBA with our outreach to receive approval to teach classes in their states. Repeated communications written and oral have been required for a handful of states. Some states refuse to sign off or have statutory requirements, making it difficult and dispiriting for auxiliaries to teach safe boating classes. The result has been a suspension of teaching auxiliary safe boating education in a small number of states. The very good news is that Commodore Mark Stone of District 1 South was instrumental in getting New Jersey back on board, and we thank him for his invaluable assistance. My recent attendance at the NASBA annual meeting in Pittsburgh was most productive in speaking with some of those boating law administrators face-to-face, -face, and we expect to have additional improvement with those difficult states. And lastly, communications to the deck plate remain an ongoing challenge for us. While the education directorate has been able to perform workarounds that are much less desirable and effective than what is needed, we do not have an institutional system that allows easy and routine communications to the deck plate member. The current system of the chain of leadership passing emails down to the members fails us continually, so we need to find a better and reliable way to reach individual members. Our experience communicating to specific groups such as instructors demonstrate that our members want to be informed and want to communicate with us. We need to develop a system that facilitates those member desires. And with that, I thank you very much. That's all from the education director. Thank you, David. Uh, your teams have become so much more valuable with the increase of uneducated, inexperienced voters just in the past year, 18 months, going out and buying boats and putting them in the water and hoping for the best. So I'm grateful for all that you and your teams are doing. That brings us to Director V, Jim Cortez. V is Vessel Examinations and Program Visits. Thank you, Commodore. Um, I wanted to add a little bit of perspective to what you had just, the comment you just made about the increases in, in uh, boaters. So right now, um, the increase in, in Boat purchases, according to the National Marine Manufacturers Association, has been 12% in 2020. So it brings us to about 310,000 extra units that are sold um, each year and or, or this past year. 
But most of that growth is within the 26 foot and under uh, vessel size, which is our sweet spot uh, here in VE. And um, just for additional perspective, it's a $47 billion industry that supports about 700,000 jobs and uh, about 100 million Americans go boating each year. So that brings me to kind of what, what, uh, what our ups and downs are in the directorate. And I do have some new information because we did have some uh, lag of reporting. Um, thanks to Perry Taylor for bringing this uh, new information uh, up to us uh, as late as last Thursday. So um, vessel safety checks reported for this year are 53,321 to date, which is 109% increase over 2020. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is we're still down about 8,200 from 2019 when we're at full strength. So <clears throat> that can be attributed to um, about 1,100 uh, fewer vessel examiners who, fail, who failed to uh, go through rework and get recertified. And uh, so, so the one thing I would encourage you on our, on our, or our teams is that the vessel safety check program is the fastest way to get a new member contributing to the auxiliary and to the Coast Guard's uh, missions. So they can significantly make a lasting contribution to those missions by uh, joining the ranks of the VSC team. Um, we're getting more information from the Coast Guard now to get ahead of the, you know, the law changes that occur so we can get uh, better information out to the members. A good example is uh, the 22, 2022 fire protection change that's happening in the CFR. And that's designed to segregate the fire protection inspection requirements from recreational boaters uh, to uninspected um, uh, passenger vehicles. So that's coming very, very soon. Our partnerships uh, and alignments with other organizations like the Power Squadron continue to help our reach and frequency to the recreational boater public. And the collaboration continues and the consistency is, um, is continuing to to gain greater strength. In fact, they're even starting now to look at uh, joining our programs for, or developing their own programs in alignment with ours for program visits as well. So the good news on the program visits or partner visits is we're up, we're up uh, both in people who are doing the mission, but also in the actual PVs that have been accomplished. So we've done about 68,100 roughly uh, this year already. So those are the very good things that are happening within the VEPV side of things. Uh, for the downside is we do still have to get these 1,100 people reconstituted. And um, you know, it just takes a little bit of time and, and a little bit of prodding from, from our teams to make sure that we get our qualified people back uh, doing the activities that we need them to do. The, um, we're, we're down about roughly 1,068 uh, right now. The good news then again on the PV side is we're up about 100 uh, people there. So people are doing a lot more. The, the people who are doing the mission are doing a lot more than than uh, than they have in the past. So if we can get the thousand people back on board, we'll do even greater things than we did in 2019. So uh, the revisions of the qualification materials and all the changes that are needed will help uh, aid us in those in those programs and changes and. Sir, that's uh, the conclusion of my report. I want to thank you very much. I want to thank you for the way that you're approaching your challenges. And on a completely different note, I am admiring your shoulder board collection behind you. That is awesome. Yeah, Alex um, likes it too. I just saw him clapping. I'll, I'll have to, have to uh, go into business. Yeah, it's starting out with the Navy and then into us. And that's awesome. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to Commodore Bob Lauer, a NACO RB. Commodore? Uh, thank you, uh, Commodore. How would you like to be standing behind those guys when they got through? Uh, those uh, three, three folks and their teams are uh, absolutely awesome, and it's really a pleasure for me to uh, be connected. So, RBS greetings to uh, all of those uh, that have joined us today. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Robert Lauer. I'm the Agnaco RB. It's an honor to be here. Uh, our RBS directories of uh, directorates have performed brilliantly and produced outstanding results during uh, 2021. They continue to move ahead, 
producing new and innovative products and strategies used by our districts and partners in the voting community. And Peter Jensen said a few minutes ago that because of his directors, he gets a good night's sleep. And I would say, Peter, that that uh, I share uh, the same benefit with you. And I, I, I'll put it this way. Uh, the, or, the extraordinary approach, the work that they do, and their 24-7 20, availability, coupled with their quick response to changing conditions, provide a major benefit to our entire organization, our partners, and uh, the voting public that we support. You know, they weren't, uh, B, E, and V were not affected by, COVID, uh, by the COVID restrictions. They continued to produce the outstanding results during this time of uh, national slowdown. Uh, by now you have heard the good news and, and progress of B, E, and V during the ups and the challenges. These uh, results and observations reflect their hard work, their enthusiasm, and sense of urgency as it relates to the recreational boating safety. The RBS directorates have performed well against the Commodore strategic plan. The action items to RBS are either complete or in process. A direct result of the RBS directorate performance against a strategic plan, uh, five more objectives were added to, uh, to the plan and will be delivered upon or before October of 2022. As all of you are aware, it's, in vital, it's of vital importance that the members and leadership of RBS populate the boards and committees that affect safe boating legislation, education, and marine component manufacturing. And currently we have uh, Dave Fuller and Bob Brandenstein represent the auxiliary on the NASPLA Education Standards Panel, and I'll be representing the AUX uh, as at the National Safe Boating Council. We continue to examine other opportunities where we can lead, advise, and add value to our partners in the safe boating field. So our overall focus is to improve our performance during the entire boating season through both conventional and public, uh, uh, conventional and social media interactions with our boating public. The e directorates working locally. You've heard uh, uh, some of the stories inside the auxiliary fence line to improve the conversations and communication process with the districts. To accomplish that, they just completed a series of meetings with the District DC uh, Chiefs of Staff and the DSOs PE to continue to share best practices, new products, and new techniques. And I'm proud to report that they've been uh, very successful. The E-words getting out and district partnerships are being developed. With the in-person NACON uh, canceled, the E-Directorate uh, immediately seized the opportunity to schedule and deliver a National Instructor Development Train the Trainer course. It was presented to the DSO PE cadre and their support staffs. The course yielded spectacular results as many of the students are now acting as trainers, trainers and mentors in their respective districts. And that would have been the same presentation that they would have given at NACON. The e directorates. Uh, completed the maximum award process and the winners have been selected. The physical awards will be delivered later this year. One of the long-term projects for E is the development of the and the delivery of Kids Don't Float. And the Kids Don't Float program is very popular in Alaska. It has all the same applications uh, everywhere where cold or hard water can be found. So stand by for a vision of that. Uh, which should be uh, soon. The e director has done a complete review on the library of courses and seminars. One of the results is the decision to schedule BSNS for a refresh, and it will permit the use of the BSNS core as a certificate course and allow for the standalone modules to be used for designing courses to fit the local needs. And here's a sort of a surprising result of that. Uh, e surveyed the districts to find out what they wanted as the first module to be developed. The unanimous choice by the districts was navigation. 
So the navigation module will be the first module developed and delivered. Another priority for E has been their preteen and teen classes. They're developing best practices for units to approach the schools and get in the door to provide our valuable information uh, to the preteen and teen groups. And what we do know is this. We know that a safe boat in cold water education delivered to those age groups is an effective tool as it is passed on to the parents by their children. The director and staff have developed a project matrix to help them manage their workload going forward. The matrix consists of 40 plus projects. They commit resources, a fixed due date, along with project specifics. The matrix is reviewed every four weeks, and this is the one of the tools, this is one of the tools they use to keep on course and provide far-sighted solutions and ideal results. Uh, the good news uh, for everyone would, would be Jim Cortez and V have completed the review and the rework of the Vessel Examination Certification Program. The updated Vessel Examination Qualification Training is complete, posted and available through the National Testing Center. The, the Vessel Safety Check Testing Preparatory Material is available and posted for member training. This material has been developed and delivered also through the United States Power Squadron to keep consistency between the two organizations uh, uh, delivery as well. The Vessel Safety Check Manual is currently under review for potential update. It is a work in progress with BSX. The Partner Visitation Manual rewrite has been completed and pending approval. Exemplary performance by the V Director, it is evident by their progress towards completing their outstanding objectives and taking on new opportunities that will result by the savings of lives, by the saving of lives in their boating public. Paddle craft is on everyone's mind these days. Chris Wilson and the Outreach Directorate and its partners are developing evidence-based programs aimed at inexperienced paddlers. At this point, great progress is being made as we endeavor to improve the safety record of our boating customers that are paddlers. The development of venue-specific programs, uniform specifications, and opportunities for operator training, along with discussions on operator training facilities and centers, are also underway. The Paddle Craft Safety Division has been very active during the summer of 2021. Strong, both, strong growth has been seen in the program, both in auxiliary participation and outreach to the community. And an example of that would be something that Chris uh, uh, talked about earlier, and that's uh, 10 OxPad operators and qualifiers provided an onshore training to more than 45 auxiliaries and on water to 60. The same group had direct contact with at least 300 paddlers. If this trend continues, we can expect the 1,800 next year and 10,000 the following year. Uh, that's a great ramp up, and that's, uh, that's a way to uh, start to, to uh, get some success in our programs. The B directorates performed brilliantly this year despite COVID and the other challenges they face. Their work as a group help us maintain the status of Semper Paratus. Bravo Zulu to the leadership and members of RBS for stepping up and assembling the building blocks that will take the recreational boating safety directorates into the future and improve our overall safety performance of our customers on America's waterway. The RBS directorates are comprised of dedicated professionals that possess the skills to convert ideas into positive actions and face demanding challenges without failure. They provide unwavering support for the auxiliary's objectives and unstinting commitment to mission accomplishment. It's a special honor for me to be the leader of this group. Uh, respectfully submitted, sir. Thank you, Commodore. Uh, and I'm sure everyone joining us today, whether it be on Zoom or YouTube, realizes that RBS is our job one. It's our primary responsibility and you and your teams are heading it out of the park. Thank you so very much. That will bring us to Director A, Public Affairs, 
Lourdes Oliveras. Lourdes. Yeah. Good afternoon and greetings to all from Puerto Rico. I am Lourdes Oliveras, Director of Public Affairs, the A Directorate. On behalf of our Deputy Directors, Mary Patton, Sean Peoples, and our amazing and outstanding staff, here are the following ops and challenges of the Public Affairs Directorate. Ops, public, uh, publications and history accomplishments. Our online publication, the Navigator Express for the second quarter was published and sent online to all hands. The Navigator Express for the third quarter has been reviewed and approved to be published and be shared with our membership in an L2 very soon. The Navigator and the Navigator Express are seeing an increase in topics and activities as the auxiliary emerges from COVID-19 stand down. With this rise in our activities, successful publication and posting of many good news at the Assigned National Aux What's New site has been accomplished. The A Directorate continues to constantly update the A Directorate's website webpage with the most recent information and references that we have available as well as transforming it into a more user-friendly website for our members and general public. The University of Kansas has awarded our chief historian and history division chief the publication of the manuscript for showing how to fight the combat history of the US Coast Guard during the 20th century. After this is new information and updated. After a year of dedicated preparation by our outstanding history division staff, I am more than happy and proud to announce that the first US Coast Guard Auxiliary Virtual Museum opened this last October 6, 2021. Its digital exhibits provide a glimpse into the auxiliary's unique 82 year history and honor our organization's heritage and culture. Our virtual museum is in phase one of its comprehensive plan, so there is more coming up. Please visit our auxiliary museum at our A Directorate website. Now on marketing and social media accomplishments, our marketing division partnered with the Human Resources Directorate and completed the trifold handout directed to the families of Coast Guard Academy and Tracing Cape May graduates explaining how family members can join the Coast Guard Auxiliary to understand the numerous Coast Guard and its many missions. The first Coast Guard, US Coast Guard Auxiliary Social Media Handbook was created and submitted up the chain of leadership for approval and at present is waiting for BSX approval. Full all social media posting coverage has been provided for the 82nd US Coast Guard Auxiliary Anniversary, the Coast Guard Day Anniversary, the official promotion of 2021 NACON, the National Hispanic Heritage Month, among others. Marketing Division Video Services Branch completed a 60-second video for telecommunications operations, and they are in the process of making another video for food service culinary assistance. So stay tuned for that. Training division has successfully performed a total of 30 plus oral boards up to date. Actually, we have approximately 229 certified auxiliary public affairs specialists, and we are very proud of them. Now on the challenge side, um, it has been a little difficult getting the AUXPA specialist certifications entered in Alzada, and there has been uh, due to names and emails of personnel changes in at the aux, at the direct offices, so certificates and official information sometimes do not get to the to their offices. The second challenge has been the the list of members who have successfully completed the aux PA three aux PA two and PA one oral board events contain multiple entries on the aux PA two 
and AUX PA3 files in the AUX data too and the AUX directory. So presently, and this is uh, updated, presently a national help desk ticket has been submitted by this director to correct this issue as soon as possible. And our third challenge has been the Navigator magazine printing and distribution has a delay of more than four months at the Coast Guard graphics and printing office, totally affecting the schedule publishing and distribution dates of the magazine to all hands. And that has been to numerous um, difficulties regarding funding and some shortage of personnel. So that's, that's about it with the public affairs uh, accomplishment and challenges. So thank you very much for your attention. Any, uh, any question, any comments? So um, end of report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lourdes, for all the amazing work that you and your teams accomplished for us. Which brings us to Director H Human Resources, Lee Zimmerman. Lee. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, I want to recognize my two deputy directors because they wear so many hats and accomplish so much in support of our missions. And that would be Andrea Mazzarini. Some of you have heard his name before. He's an amazing individual working on recruiting and retention divisions and probably working quite a bit on some of the software issues too. I know he's very busy. Uh, Douglas Caldwell who is responsible for our augmentation uh, divisions. Uh, he's the one who is uh, uh, behind a lot of the issues where we have members on cutters uh, at facilities, uh, either in the health services, the food services, the clergy, but he also uh, makes sure that when the active duty needs someone to assist in a recruiting office, that we have people who can do that too. Very busy guys wear a lot of hats. Um, so our first up, if you will, is the tremendous support, tremendous support that we're getting from the Coast Guard active duty for these augmentation divisions, uh, contributing to the Coast Guard by providing direct support, whether it's a shore or a float. Uh, we are, as a result of some of this uh, activity, we're now asking the division, uh, the division members to send us journals and or notes about who's serving where, who's doing what, what kind of neat story we could pull out of it. And we can use those as public relations pieces. It's something that had been kind of a secret for a while and now we're exposing it. So also number two, despite the inactivity uh, during COVID-19, uh, inquiries about joining the auxiliary really haven't diminished. That's surprising. We have seen a lot of uh, leads, 634 so far this year. And the, obviously the relaunch of the AAMS application will help facilitate tracking and contacting these prospective members. and. Um, even though sometimes it felt like we were selling from an empty bag, uh, the leads and the prospects never slowed down. Uh, the other uh, up, the third up, is the redevelopment of our AUXFS program into a two-tier program now, uh, which is the AUXCA program, Culinary Assistant. And uh, this will actually allow more of our members to access this program. So that's our three ups. I'm very excited about that. Uh, we have a couple downs, as you would expect. The first is uh, developing an SOP, detailing one simplified system for BSX to issue our LCAT cards for all four scam augmentation. This is their credentials to get on board a facility or a base. And sometimes that can take a while. And, you know, this is just part of the part of the process. So we'd like to develop an SOP uh, to work that through. The other uh, down that we have is to developing a one-step SOP for all DCOs uh, to uh, implement a systemic and consistent augmentation process within their districts. Across the country, these augmentation divisions uh, deal differently with their districts. And some um, just 
might require a little bit more information on what they're doing and how they're doing. And then the third down uh, is that unfortunately, uh, we still continue to experience a 37% no contact by the local flotilla when viable leads are sent down. Uh, the DSOHRs are provided with the specifics of who, what, when, and where. However, that 37% no contact hasn't, has not changed much since 2018, prior to the management enhances like AAMS and the uh, new division of HQ. HQ division is the point of first contact and they are responsible for contacting within 48 hours, every one of the prospects and working through that until they actually are assigned to a flotilla. They're, they're performing at 100% at getting those prospects down. We're not missing anything, even when AAMS is not effective. Uh, AAMS is back and they're singing praises. We're glad that that's there, it'll help them out. But we are actually uh, at kind of a loss as to how to move this 37% number. It's, it's been out there for a while. We just need to address it and make sure that when a flotilla gets a, a prospect that there is that same kind of follow-up. Otherwise, after about 60 days, we lose that individual. So those are, those are my three ups and three downs. The Human Resources Directorate is, is doing a lot more than that, obviously, uh, but I only get five minutes. So Commodore, thank you, back to you. Lee, thank you so very much. Uh, your teams have been quite busy and accomplishing quite a bit. And uh, you did quite a bit with your five minutes, thank which you. will bring us to the Director of Training, Gerlinde. Hello, everyone. I want to say good afternoon to the Coast Guard leadership, to the National Auxiliary Commodore, and to our other auxiliary leadership, and to our members on YouTube. I would like to also acknowledge my Deputy Director, Michael Griffith, who, along with his team, has been instrumental in helping with all the projects that I'm getting ready to report on. Some of our major accomplishments are our OXA program is moving along at a speedy pace. OXI has had its first review by Nexcom, and my team is working on the requested updates. Ox weather and Ox navigation will be mixed up into the pipeline. We are uh, with Ox navigation, we are working on finalizing part B, which is the charting. And we hope to have that out for review soon. Ox patrol, Oxar, and Oxcom are expected to be out for review early first quarter 2022. The online bloodborne pathogens course has been published in the Moodle online classroom. We have approximately 625 members that have enrolled since it's been published. The Lectora software was used to develop that course the Lectora software is an online content development software tool, which has been instrumental in allowing us to build out the interactive learning content and the 360 view videos in Moodle. It's been a very successful course. So we're glad to have that out. Our challenges, we continue to work with our uh, chain of leadership and BSX on streamlining the leadership certificate process, including data reporting, tracking, and documentation. Our goal is for the members to complete each level without manual intervention from the DSO MTs and the training directorate staff. I know progress has been made on that and we will continue to work on that. There appears to be a conflict between the OX manual and an OLOX basic qualification course to published in 2017, uh, stating that the BQC2 can be used as a credit toward OXOP qualification. We've had a few inquiries from members who have not been receiving that credit towards their OXOP. While we were aware that the BQC2 served as a requirement, 
in lieu of APC and the AFLC to run for office. Uh, for some reason, um, we dropped the understanding that it was an op, op credit. And we also believe that the process may not have been updated as an OXOP credit somewhere along the line. Uh, in the meantime, my team and I feel uh, strongly that this course should not be considered as a credit towards OXOP. And our OXOP program is considered the PhD of our courseware. And it, that the BQC2 kind of dilutes that with, as an entry level course. But if the BQC2 is to be kept as a credit, we will need the assistance of BSX to correct that crediting process for an OXOP credit. Peter Graham as division chief for project support along with my deputy, Mark Michael Griffith, is working with Carlos Arenas, deputy director of C to implement our document repository using the Google Drive platform. Each directorate will have a folder and will be managed by their staff to archive their manuals and other documents for posterity. Right now, my directorate is beta testing it and we're hoping that it, it will be successful. We had a team meeting with Carlos in September to work out how we can migrate our manuals and exam, our OXOP manuals and exam packets to BSX efficiently along to Nextcom. Our OXOP files are fairly huge and cannot be sent as an email attachment. We're hoping that our new Google platform will alleviate the need for the old CD uh, to be used as a method of transferring documents to BSX. There has been a suggestion made that we could possibly look at using a secure software application such as Dropbox or iCloud. But in lieu of that, my team is currently beta testing, like I said, our abilities to transfer documents back and forth up and down the chain without losing any formatting or data using the Google platform. And we hope to have that process done fairly soon because as you saw, we do have a lot of packages that will be soon going up and down the chain. So I wanted to thank you for your time this afternoon. That ends my report. Thank you. One of the greatest tools that we can offer each and every one of our members is training. For us to provide personal opportunity for personal improvement for our members, that has to start with training. So that's something very, very important training is to this organization. So I thank you and your teams. And with that, I have the honor of introducing Commodore Greg Kester, a NACO F. He's waiting for a drum roll. He's unmuted. Greg, care to join us? We still don't hear you, Greg. You know sign language? Say something. Well, no, don't hear you. Greg, I'm showing you is unmuted, but we can't hear you. Greg, do you have a mute button on your headset? Perhaps if Greg tries to unplug and uh, plug back in his headset, that might be sudden. Why don't we take have... the break now and come back to him after the break? 
Commodore um, Cream, that's an outstanding suggestion. Okay, so uh, I have 1545. Why that. don't we reconvene at 1600? And hopefully uh, Commodore Kester can resolve his technical issues between now and then. Reboot. Patrick, can you start the break clock, please? Can anybody hear me? Can now, <laughs> but we're starting the break. Now we can. Correct? Don't that touch is, anything. I'm not going to. That's the weirdest thing because it was like, you know, it was off mute and I wasn't getting anybody. I couldn't even hear you guys after a little bit. Uh, that was Carol's mute switch for you, the one that she uses all the time. Oh, is that what it is? Yes. Uh, oh, you're uh, maturely now, Greg. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll see you at 1600. Okie dokie.
Well, what did you end up watching in the game? Not really. Okay. No. I actually paid attention. Well, no, actually, I was playing so <laughs> I don't think I want that much. Anything else I can get for you? Huh? Anything I can get for you? No, I'm good. Brought me a little snack here. That's fine. <laughs> Perfect. I had a few and I got tired when I went out. Yep. Yeah. Not time yet, boy. Oh yeah, this that helps. As soon as it's over, I can hit the reset button. Now I know where they are. Right. Terry, you're not muted. Thank you. Sorry.
Hey, Greg, mic check. Working now. Outstanding. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, Gary. Hey, David, how are you? I'm well, sir. How are you? Hey, so far so good. Today's still young. <laughs> <laughs> wish my well, wife could tell. I wish you the same so thing for my wife. <laughs> well, I see Terry is doing well. How's she uh, getting around? Yeah, she's doing well for you know with, with the uh, surgery and everything she had on her foot. So yeah, good. good. At least you she didn't have to have a plate put in. Yeah. Thank goodness. True. Yeah, but she got screwed. <laughs> but I'm full. He's here all week, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, it was a pleasure to see you. You too, Dave. How's things in the, the sunshine state? Uh, weird as usual, but good. <laughs> you miss New York? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I, I catch New York one and I get the phone calls and text messages and emails from all my uh, friends and neighbors back home. And from what I'm understanding, I'm not missing much. If yeah, what I am missing, I'm, gra I'm glad to be missing it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, you know, the city is pretty much, you know, it, it seems like it's back to normal anyway, especially where I am. It's crazy. Mm. It's, you know, it's, it's hipster capital of the world. So. Everybody's out in the streets, you know, eating in the cafe. Everything's outdoor dining. So, hey, welcome back, everyone. Before we uh, get started again, I just want to ask each of our presenters to be mindful of your allotted time. So, with that in mind, we will move forward. And I understand Commodore Kester has got his technical issues resolved and. He's about to present to us, Greg. Yes, I have. Thank you. Um, as my directors and deputies have already introduced themselves, I'd like to introduce my deputy ANAC OFC, Tom Siniglio. How are you doing, Tom? He's muted. Yeah. I'm doing good. Thank you, Greg. Look good. You're looking good as usual. <laughs> Okay. Um, in terms of the strategic plan, uh, we've pretty well covered all of our milestones. Uh, we've got a, a couple um, milestones with um, HR and um, the prevention folks as far as trying to uh, develop some recruiting in that area, yet outstanding. But at the same time, um, our um, H directorate has also submitted several uh, strategic plan midterm uh, revisions for uh, next column review. So we'll see where we go with that. Um, just some quick highlights. Um, one of the things that uh, I think is fascinating in terms of the training directorate, uh, the OX04, which is the distance learning C school um, is now online. Uh, it has 25 attendees. And this includes both auxiliarists and we have active duty personnel. So people are uh, on the goal side looking very intently at our new Moodle platform and how effective it's going to be and you know what our uh, security procedures and so forth will be with it. Um, human resources. I got to say bravo Zulu to the culinary assistance programs. Um, hopefully they'll be putting out some uh, public affairs information soon. Uh, the Laguerre just came back into port and we had an outstanding uh, auxiliarist on board that uh, jumped in and helped out with, um, you know, everything from his responsibilities as an ox culinary assistant to um, helping uh, work on the bridge, helming the ship and so forth. Uh, we've also had uh, auxiliarists that have gone out on uh, uh, polar cutters. Uh, I believe it was the Healy. Um, so they had, uh, I think, public affairs personnel on that one as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing some uh, interesting 
articles and some pictures coming from uh, both the H directorate and the uh, A directorate. Uh, chaplain support, uh, outstanding. It's as usual um, going uh, gangbusters. Uh, they've provided over 4,168 hours uh, for Ox chaplains, counseling, spiritual guidance for Coast Guard families, uh, especially during the COVID issues and multiple funerals and other requests. So again, bravo Zulu to uh, all of our outstanding uh, folks that are supporting the goal side. Uh, that also includes our medical folks. Um, you know, we did uh, something this year that's not been done in the past and we actually uh, had uh, assisted the Coast Guard Academy with coronary background uh, checks on new cadets. Uh, some of the other academies have had issues where uh, cadets have had cardiac incidences and so forth, and we were able to uh, assist and make sure we didn't have those type of issues, and if we did, uh, help alleviate those type of problems. Um, Again, another um, outstanding work on uh, the public affairs. Um, they had full social media coverage of virtually all of the uh, major events for the Coast Guard this year. Everything from Women's Month, uh, Pacific American Heritage Month, um, you know, our 82nd birthday, Coast Guard Day, uh, and also um, they provided uh, some uh, graphics for the 20th year uh, anniversary of 9-11. So aside from that, we have an outstanding team. Uh, keep encouraging them to keep up the good work. And I will uh, say goodbye for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commodore. You and your teams are doing an amazing job. And please know that your efforts are truly appreciated. So that will bring us up to the ANACOCC Chief Counsel. For those of you who are unaware, in addition to wearing a uniform, this ANACO gets a superhero cape. So Commodore Crean, whose main function has been to keep me on the straight and narrow, would you uh, kindly take the front stage? Oh, thank you. I would uh, be very pleased to do that, uh, the NACO. And good afternoon, Captain Glendie, NACO, V NACO, A NACO, DIRs, and shipmates. And particularly, welcome to the over 100 members who have signed on to view this uh, operation and to learn how the operating committee serves the membership, discharges its responsibilities, and moves the finest volunteer service in the world forward. Bravo Zulu to each and every one of you for taking the time on a Saturday afternoon to educate yourselves on how execution of the multi-missions of the Coast Guard Auxiliary is accomplished. This brief overview is intended to let you know just a little bit about the very fine professionals who make it possible to provide the world-class legal services to the leadership and membership of our Coast Guard Auxiliary. Although I may be the face of the Office of Chief Counsel, let that sink in for a minute. There are five others who step up to provide support in the delivery of legal services to the uh, leadership of this auxiliary. I'm not going to be discussing the district staff officers, uh, legal parliamentarians, in the expectation that you know who they are, have worked with them in the past and understand how talented and willing they are to assist the district leadership in discharging their responsibilities under the law, regulations, and commandant policies that we have all pledged to follow. By regulation, the ANACO CC serves as legal advisor to the NACO, provides counsel to the chief director on auxiliary issues, and reviews significant legal issues arising within the auxiliary units. Now those legal issues involve the entirety of federal law and regulation, as well as compliance with the myriad of commandant instructions and policies of the Department of Homeland Security. It's an awesome responsibility 
and it's a never, ever, never ending challenge. Fortunately, a deputy chief counsel is authorized to assist the ANACO CC. My outstanding deputy is the Honorable Bruce Kelton, who's a supervising administrative law judge for the Department of Health and Human Services. Judge Kelton supervises other administrative law judges and adjudicates appeals from Medicare determinations. Bruce works very closely with the three assistant chief counsels and the DSOLPs, in addition to always being willing and available for consultation with me as the need arises. I simply couldn't do the job without Bruce's able assistance. Now the area assistant chief counsels are uh, responsible for land area east, land area west, and the PAC areas and assist me as well as the four DNACOs and the other DSLLPs in their respective areas. Anthony Wisniewski is the assist assistant chief counsel for Land East. Uh, he's also the executive director of Avanta Government Services, which provides specialized services for federal and state government entities arising from independent reviews, uh, business outsources, and solutions. Anthony served as an advisor in the administration of President Donald Trump. Keith Blosser, my assistant chief counsel for Atlantic West, is the former managing director of human relations and operations with the County Commissioners Association of Ohio and worked with the Ohio Department of Education as an enforcement attorney in regulation, rule and enforcement. Jeannie Sochodalski is Assistant Chief Counsel for the PAC area. Now, Assistant Chief Counsels may also be appointed to address specific legal subject areas. And Jean is Assistant Chief Counsel for Intellectual Property and a rocket scientist. Seriously, she's a rocket scientist. Jeannie currently serves as Patent and Intellectual Property Counsel for the Naval Undersea Warfare Center in Keyport, Washington. Yes, that's the place where the boomers and the nukes and the fast attacks uh, come out of and uh, provide coverage for the uh, United States of America. She graduated from Duke with a degree in engineering and earned a master of science in aeronautics and astronautics from the Univers University of Washington. After a brief career designing rockets at Boeing, I told you she was a rocket scientist. She earned a JD from the University of Southern California and commenced a lengthy career as a patent and corporate counsel for major high tech and aerospace firms, including Microsoft, Boeing, and Honeywell. Jean recently earned a Master of Law in Space, Cyber, and Telecommunications Law from the University of Nebraska and has uh, served extensively as an expeditionary in field science experience. She was elected a member of the Explorers Club in 2009 and is a multi-year veteran of the US Antarctic program, including wintering over as the manager of McMurdo at the South Pole Station. Jean has written peer reviewed papers on cyber warfare and the use of UAVs in warfare. Jack Young, Assistant Chief Counsel for Administrative Law is a partner in a Washington DC firm, a very experienced and internationally recognized litigator in the field of administrative law and has served in various capacities for former presidents Clinton and Obama. Yeah, we've got Republicans, we've got Democrats, we've got everybody. Jack recently worked with me in preparing a briefing, a briefing memo for NACO relating to how important matters of international law applied to active duty Coast Guard, engaged in international operations, applied to members of the Coast Guard Auxiliary while assigned to duty. All right, so there's a brief overview of the folks that are serving. What do we actually do in the Office of Chief Counsel? Of Chief Counsel? Well, we provide legal services to the national elected leadership. We provide legal services to the national appointed leadership at all levels. We provide legal services in the nation of consultation with active duty district staff judge advocates 
who were the Coast Guard's lawyers. We provide legal service to the district commodores when requested and in order to assist the DSOLPs. We also consult with DSOLPs on issues within their respective districts and, a host, and we host a monthly meeting of all DSOLPs to discuss legal issues common to the auxiliary, such as most recently, the application of sovereign immunity to members of the auxiliary when assigned to duty and the application of an understanding of the standard operating procedures for elections by electronic means, obviously a matter which has taken on uh, importance and significance now during the pandemic, the pandemic that's extended over a period of two years. We liaise with Captain Troy Glendai, Chief Director of the Coast, o Coast Guard Office of Auxiliary, Boating, Auxiliary and Boating Safety and his staff, most often with the incredibly hardworking, dedicated and knowledgeable Steve Minatulo, Commander, U.S. Coast Guard, retired, who is the Chief of the Administrative Branch. We consult with BS BSX with regard to many of the programs and operations of the auxiliary and the execution of the auxiliary's mission of support to the Coast Guard. All right, that's generally what we do. Shall we get to specifics? Yeah, I think we will. Well, we interpret the standing rules in the Coast Guard Auxiliary Manual for the National Board and when, re when required to district boards, divisions and flotillas. We provide assistance in complying with the auxiliary manual, federal law, and other statutes, both state and municipal, when accepting gifts of, of money or property by the auxiliary and its subordinate elements. We provide information and services regarding local and federal taxation issues, prohibited source determinations, personnel issues, membership issues, intellectual property questions, disciplinary issues, contracts with outside vendors. We help to draft and review memoranda of agreement or memoranda of understanding with program partners such as the Boy Scouts, West Marine, National Safe Boating Council, Power Squadrons, also known as the America's Boating Club, and the Civil Air Patrol, to name just a very few. We consult with the Council for the Coast Guard Auxiliary Association, and we deal with areas and issues of international law of the sea, to name just a few. And that provides the brief overview of the people and the activities of the Office of Chief Counsel of your Coast Guard Auxiliary. Vineko, thank you for the opportunity of providing this information. Out. Commodore, thank you so much. And I wish that you would convey my gratitude to every member of your team. They do an outstanding job. And I, for one, personally, am grateful for you of always having been there for me. Picked up that phone, I would hear your voice, and immediately my mind was at ease. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's an honor. Okay, so that will bring us to a NACO diversity, Commodore Dave Porter. Dave? Distinguished guests, Commodores, and shipmates, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the time to present. I'd like to begin by first thanking uh, our NACO and VNACO for allowing the diversity team to have the flexibility to work with all of our division and flotilla units throughout the pandemic to make modifications to the way we were all operating uh, over the last year, um, which further allowed more units to participate in the NACO three-star award program. That being said, the following things occurred over the last, the, the, the last year and a half. Um, well, we continued with our website maintenance enhancements and updates have been completed. Uh, and we are set to submit our strategic plan covering us the years 2021 through 2024. Town hall meetings have continued to train the membership uh, in the tenets of diversity and inclusion, having served over 1,100 participants this year. At the close of the NACO three-star award application submission period, we received a total of 385 submissions, which is 11 more than we received last year. We attribute this increase due to the outreach, the town hall meetings and websites enhancements, 
and the flexibility again afforded by both the directorate and the member uh, directorate and the membership in preparing, forwarding, and reviewing the applications. This year, we had representation from every district in the organization. Members of the directorate have been engaged with CG12 and CG127's Office of Diversity and Inclusion in their formation and impl implementation of their DIAP, Diversity and Inclusion Action Plan. It became quickly apparent that both the Coast Guard and its auxiliary are tracking in the same direction, having identified some of the same issues and the means to address same. To that end, we have auxiliaries that have become and are and or are training to become change agents in support of our collective diversity and inclusion mission. We are starting work to populate the best practices tab on our website in order to showcase the ideas and practices of our auxiliary units that shows what makes them strong and helps to retain and attract members. A proposal has been forwarded to the NEXTCOM bridge for enhancements to the NACO three-star award of which includes the formal addition of four FEMA courses to be added to AUX Data 2 to include the IS-20 Diversity Awareness course, IS-21 Civil Rights and FEMA Diverse uh, Disaster Assistance course, IS-368 including people with disabilities and, uh, and others with access and functional needs in disaster operations, and finally IS-505 Concepts of Religious Literacy for Emergency Management. We feel that adding these courses will serve to better our understanding of the varying diverse issues that these topics cover and enable us to serve our members and, and those uh, we are seeking to recruit. At this time, we have approval from the VNACO and NACO to proceed with this venture and shall proceed to conclude same. We, uh, as we've achieved uh, two and a half of our five goals, um, one of which we, uh, we uh, achieved two years early, which was to have 40% of all active units apply for the NACO three-star award, while we look to improve to 50% over the next operational period of our strategic plan. Uh, we will shift our focus uh, to aiding and increasing the number of DNI staff officers at the flotilla and division level, while partnering with the measurements team to quantify the number of operational qualifications held by our members so as to be in line with our diversity of mission concept. So as previously stated, we've achieved uh, our 40% increase uh, this year in spite of COVID. Uh, of 509, uh, we have 509 appointed um, FSOs out of a total of 811 eligibles and 128 of 151 division staff officers. What that number uh, indicates to us is that we're tracking to meet our projected goal of having a minimum of 80% of diversity staff officer positions filled by 2024. At current, at the division level, we've exceeded that already. We're at 85%, 128 of, uh, of 151 units. At the flotilla level, we're, we're trudging along at 63%, having 500 and, I'm sorry, 509 units, um, uh, having staff officer positions at the flotilla level. To make up our 80%, we need to encourage, entice, cajole, and strong arm, if necessary, 140 flotilla units in order to, uh, to meet our projected goal. With that, sir, I am done with my presentation. Thank you all for your time. And we look forward to working with you all. Commodore, thank you, and I'm sure that you and most of our viewers are aware how important diversity is to this bridge. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And with that, I would like to introduce Commodore Bob Bruce, a NACO FN. Thank you, Commodore. Uh, the a NACO for CFO, I have that thing on the program, uh, reports to the BNACO and uh, as the financial advisor to the National Commodore and NEXCOM. Currently, uh, I also serve as a member of the Coast Guard Auxiliary Association Board of Directors. In the finance area, the air activities and support of strategic plan, one was to increase the visibility over the way the Auxiliary Association handles um, our money. And through weekly and often more frequently calls with the Auxiliary Association CFO, 
have a much better visibility um, than was ever possible before. We worked with and supported changes in the Auxiliary Association financial processes and controls. Uh, and significant processes of, uh, progress has been made to where every bill paid by the Auxiliary Association that is charged to an auxiliary budget is approved by the auxiliary CFO. Also, my deputy, Donna Miller, from District 7, is working on revising existing financial reporting forms. Um, and you may have seen one uh, having to do with requests for orders um, for NACON. A financial control working group was started, um, what, a couple of years ago, but the pandemic has kind of slowed it down. But it was uh, working to, to look at strengthening financial controls throughout the organization. Um, there was really a, um, a lack of specific um, controls or standards um, for the auxiliary units to go by. So the, the, the group has finalized recommendations uh, for an auxiliary financial controls SOP. Uh, is hopefully will be used at all levels of the organization. These uh, recommendations are waiting approval and implementation by the chief director, and we hope to have it delivered at the next end train. The financial control working group includes me, my deputy, Mr. Minotillo from BSX, Commander Susan Heyman, who is Dirox of 8 East and Western, Chief Counsel Doug Cream, Commodore Dan Marish of 8 Western, and Margaret Albert, who is the uh, DSOFN for District 13. In other activities, my deputy is working, um, is actually heading a group of members, including IT members, to centralize and manage all software licenses to avoid duplication and reduce overall costs. We found out uh, in the last budget cycle that several different um, directorates were buying the same software and not using it to maximum effectiveness. So if you have any new software needs, uh, contact me or Donna, please. The budget for 2022 is currently in development. Uh, all budget holders should notify me of any unusual or new requirements. Uh, also, please review your budgets from last year to make sure that all needed items are included. Uh, had a couple of um, cases where right after the budget was approved, people said, well, gee, I forgot to put this in. Well, gee, this is a good time to go back and make sure that, that you add that in. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Commodore. It's appreciated. That brings me to Richard Mahalchik. Um, Rich is going to enlighten us something new that we've got going on, and he's going to give you a high-level view of some exciting things. Rich, floor is yours. Thank you, Commodore. So a while back, Commodore Maluski came to me, and uh, the Coast Guard reached out to us regarding some certain investigations that they wanted to do, or they wanted us to help and be integrated with. Uh, part of it stemmed from the Marine uh, credential uh, fraud case that started out and is now up to about 1,500 cases. But uh, it took uh, Commodore Cream and the legal counsel over at the Coast Guard a while to allow us to start working with them in certain investigations. And that's part of the reason why I'm here and, and we're trying to uh, expand on this again with the Coast Guard uh, legal giving us their blessing. Part of the problem was that uh, they needed help in uh, putting together some of these complaints, reviewing the complaints. And that's where our Commodore Cream came into play where he assembled a great team of uh, attorneys who assisted them. On my end here, I has brought together a team of investigators and we were able to uh, help track down and working with the Coast Guard, the Marine Credential Task Force, uh, and tracking down a lot of these members who fled. 
Uh, we're batting 100%. I can tell uh, Commodore Maluski. Uh, we our turnaround time for these people that the Coast Guard is not able to find. We do it within 48 hours. Uh, one time it did take us five days. That's only because we had to track the person through Guam, Asia, and then back to the United States. So that took us five days to do. Sorry about that, Commodore Maluski. Um, so they're trying to expand on requesting us in conducting or helping them in other types of their investigations. And again, that's something that is being worked out through legal and through Commodore um, uh, uh, Cream. Another part of this is talking about documentation. Uh, and um, a lot of our documentation tends to go nowhere. If you look at like the spreadsheets and some of our old um, uh, documents that we filled out tracking, it kind of just stops. And what we like to do is put together a policy or policies that allows us to archive these documents. So therefore, you know, we have our history in a safe place and it's available to anybody in the future to see what we've done in the past. I know that's, uh, you know, something that we should be doing. We also have an archiving uh, museum down there in East Carolina State where a lot of our documentation should go to especially when we talk about the secretaries uh, and their records that they keep, we really need to start putting that in certain places. Um, and we would just, like I said, um, I don't know how much further I could go on this. I know I only have five minutes and I'm approaching four minutes, but I'm looking forward to talking to a lot of the DCOs on the missions that we're working on and we'd like to work on in the future. Um, and I don't know what else I can add to it. Like I said, I'm at my five minute point. Commodore Fumano. Rich, I really want to thank you for enlightening our members as to what's going on in the aspect of administrative services. And on a completely different note, is that Taz and Bugs behind you on the wall? Yes, yes. That's my, uh, my kids. <laughs> well done. Very well done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Keep up the fantastic work. All right. Okay, so that brings us next to SMS, Safety Management Systems. And I have the honor of supporting this initiative, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Commodore Bob Schaefer. Commodore. Thank you, Captains, Commodores, friends, greetings. It's great to be with you once again for an OPCOM. This is my 29th. And I would too wish very much that we could be together for the face-to-face -face conversations and the fellowship that we all miss, but we're not doing that because it's not safe. A hazard threatened us, so we changed our method of operation to mitigate the threat. It's as if we had a flexible culture, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The Coast Guard Auxiliary has always been a safety organization. We exist to promote recreational boating safety, and we help the Coast Guard with their maritime safety and their public safety missions. At our core, we're a safety organization, and we always have been. So many industries, including hospitals and transportation, maritime, aviation, rail, manufacturers, and others, have adopted safety management systems to help them improve their organizational safety cultures reduce mishaps, and increase effectiveness. Well, as a safety organization, we should take that same professional approach to safety as well. So early this year, we began work on a comprehensive approach to safety throughout our organization, a safety management system, or SMS, for the auxiliary. It's one of the priorities of our strategic plan, and it's a commandant instruction. We assembled a team of expert members who have begun mapping out the way to build a safety program throughout our organization. We've started training auxiliary members and leaders on what it takes to develop a safety culture. We're building on the foundational elements of any safety management system, safety policies, risk management, safety assurance, and safety promotion, and we'll implement those throughout the auxiliary. We're off to a great start, and I must thank Commodore Don Zinner for his work to get this initiative going. 
He saw safety management systems in use out in the real world, and it was his vision that the auxiliary should adopt the same kind of professional approach to, safe, to a safety program. So thanks to Don Zinner for getting this team together to take the first steps. So what's next? Well, our safety program initial development advisory board will continue to meet and work. And we're joined by our active duty colleagues in the Coast Guard Office of Safety and Environmental Health who provide excellent guidance and assistance. As a foundational step in developing a safety culture, we've been sharing the concept of a just culture an environment in which members feel comfortable reporting and discussing mishaps and mistakes without concern for retribution, reprisal, penalty, or punishment. It's only when a just culture exists that a reporting culture can exist. And a reporting culture allows people to report mishaps and mistakes and hazards. Such reporting informs us and allows us to learn and improve. The resulting informed culture and learning culture enable a flexible culture. And it's then that we realize a true safety culture in which we can adapt as necessary, much as we have adapted for this OPCOM. So as one of our next steps, we need to consider the structure that the safety program will take throughout our organization at the national level and in the districts. We will solicit input from the districts and will allow flexibility as necessary. We need to understand our data needs and find the appropriate collection tools. We have a great start on defining our requirements. We have some very talented people working on this. We need to continue training and promoting safety at every opportunity. Recently, we gave presentations to district leaders on just culture, and now we'll continue with information on the other components of a safety culture and how a safety management system functions. And we need to communicate this, all of this, to each and every member of our organization. And we have to remember the long game. It takes time to change culture. We will have to work past institutional inertia. What? We've never done it that way before. So we have to repeat the messages. We have to teach them to every member, the newest as well as the more senior. At an OPCOM someday in the future, after we're long gone, members who are new today will be in the same leadership positions that we have now. We're building something for them, something that they will continue. And we want them to think of safety as something that has always been a part of the fabric of the auxiliary. Safety, always. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Commodore. And uh, I know exactly that it's not an easy task developing this culture of safety. And I wanna thank you and your team. You're doing a great job. Okay, now we have a uh, video. Uh, Commander Jim Cooley wanted to be with us today, but couldn't. So he prepared a very brief video uh, from the Coast Guard Office of Safety Management. Patrick, at your convenience. All right, I'm recording. Well, hello everyone. I am Commander Jim Cooley. I'm one of the aviation safety managers in the Office of Safety and Environmental Health at headquarters. The Office of Safety and Environmental Health, CG113, is working hand in hand with the auxiliary to create a safety management system or SMS. I'm talking to you as the auxiliary aviation safety manager in the safety program management division. And we have been aggressively working with an AUX uh, advisory group. The goal of the SMS is to maximize mission effectiveness by mitigating hazards to manage risk to acceptable levels and prevent mishaps. SMS, that's the formal organization-wide approach to managing safety risk and assuring the effectiveness of safety risk controls. <clears throat> this involves procedures, practices, and policies for the management of safety risk. 
safety management systems obligate organizations to manage safety with the same level of priority that other core business processes are managed at. So why are you listening to me? Why is this important? We wish to promote safety initiatives to adopt a safety culture wherein members feel safe to report safety issues, near misses, mistakes, and to adapt uh, as these lessons are learned. We're talking about a state of mind. States of mind are invisible aspects of SMS or any culture for that matter, and states of mind are not easily affected. But this last point may easily be the most important. In utopia, I wouldn't even have a job. Safety would not be its own thing, its own headquarters office, its own officer position and so forth. Because the goal is to have it embedded in every aspect of every action, operation, decision and behavior and safety elements are baked in so well, you don't even notice it as an ingredient. Okay, well, what's an SMS? What does it look like? Well, here's kind of a, a quick list. Um, it involves hazard identification, mishap reporting, safety climate assessments, quality assurance, risk and gain assessments, mishap exercise uh, tra uh, training, um, and a whole lot of invisible, notwithstanding important stuff like leadership, psychological safety, and motivation to contribute to mishap prevention by way of reporting. <laughs> There is no shortage of research that shows the correlation between leadership and safety culture. Further, safety cultures permeate uh, every single aspect of safe operations, whether it's reporting an unintentional elision while getting underway or following a maintenance procedure for routine tasks. People's perceptions and behaviors affect mission effectiveness. So as you already, as you may already know, uh, the Coast Guard defines its safety culture with five subcomponents you can see here. Uh, the just culture, the reporting culture, learning culture, informed culture, and flexible culture. But what you may not know is the interplay therein. An organization cannot have one successful safety culture subcomponent without the rest. Perhaps the most important is the just culture, the state of the just culture affects employees' willingness to speak up, which affect the quality and quantity of safety information inputs or reporting culture, which is needed in order to enrich the, the learning culture and so on. A relic of a healthy safety culture is witnessed by the extent to which organization members report and learn from mistakes. All the safety culture components may degrade or augment each other collectively. There is not a just culture just because the leader says there is. There needs to be a genuine buy-in where people feel safe to report their own mistakes. Within positive safety cultures, not only are mis uh, mishap occurrences kept at bay, but all the components of safety management systems perform like a well-oiled machine. What I want to impress upon you is this. Mission effectiveness is a direct result of safety initiatives. Without Coast Guard assets, there is no ability to do what it is we all signed up to do. So as my counterparts in the auxiliary continue with their initiatives to get an SMS up and running, please champion that work with alacrity and buy-in. And thank you all for your attention so long. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, according to our schedule, we have some allotted time for questions and answers. So for the members following us right now via YouTube, you can type those questions out and they'll relate them to me. If uh, I can't get you an answer right now, I promise I will get back to you with an answer, but I'd rather give you something that was accurate instead of instant. So, with that in mind. Hey, Gus. Yes, sir. Initial comment of Tom O'Lally. I was wondering, a question for Patrick was, how's our uh, attendance on YouTube doing? Uh, we were around 100. Patrick, where are we now? 
We've got 91 currently on YouTube and we peaked right around 110. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? I know we uh, provided you with some outstanding information today, but you, I would think there, that might have uh, sparked a question or two. Okay, in answer to the question that just came from me to me from our administrator, Patrick, at this moment in time, there are no plans for auxiliaries to be able to learn new languages, but I would not be opposed to exploring something like that down the road. I know that a lot of the uh, branches of the military uh, utilize services such as Rosetta Stone. So something like that could be explored. Commodore, if I may. Yes. Um, with regards to language education, um, the Interpreter Corps is actually providing language services to active duty Coast Guard right now. Um, our interpreters are teaching classes on a biweekly basis on several languages and providing that to Coast Guard headquarters and sectors throughout the nation. And we can expand this out to, um, to the auxiliaries as well. That would be fantastic. Thank you. See, you ask a question, you get an amazing answer. Uh, next question, we're going to have uh, the T director weigh in, and it regards proctored exams. Have we returned to the requirement for proctored exams? Uh, hello, this is Gerlindy. And no, as far as I know from NEXTCOM, we are going to continue forward with the present process. Thank you. Okay, we have a question regarding the, when will the next virtual AUX 10 C school be offered? And how may someone sign up? And how may someone sign up? I don't have a date, but it will be, it will be soon. Uh, I, and they would sign up by contacting my deputy, Bob Fritz, Robert Fritz. He's in the uh, in AUX directory and he's handling registrations along with Linda McCarty. Um, they're just finishing up their first, first ever what right now. So they'll probably take a week or two off and then start another one if I know that group. We also have, um, we also have four standard Aux 10 C schools scheduled for 2022, you know, given allowances for COVID and budget and everything like that. So there should be lots of educational opportunities for information services officers coming up. Thank you, Randy. Great answer. Okay, the next question. Is the TCOPQS being revised to better reflect the changes in technology? That's an excellent question. Yeah, um, yes, this is Rick Saunders. Um, yes, it is because there have been a lot of changes in technology. So that was a critical element of it as well as risk management. They're really the significant changes to it. Thank you, Rick. What would be the best path to assist our national team in areas they might be seeking assistance? Well, we constantly update the help wanted. I would check that often. And if you have a special skill set, you may want to just reach out to someone within that directorate and advise them of that. They may not be aware of it, but the help wanted uh, is updated frequently. YT, I'm not sure who you are, but I have to agree. And please allow me to read your comment. These folks deserve maximum likes and thumbs up 
for all of their hard work. They absolutely do. And not a day goes by that two things don't occur with me. One is to take a moment out and be grateful for each and every one of them. And secondly, most importantly, to remind myself that we're all volunteers. It's very important that we never lose sight of that. Okay, from uh, Dr. Gottschall, kudos to all the presenters, very succinct material, well worth the time. Thank you, Doc. Okay, with that, I think at this point in time, I will uh, see if any of the NEXTCOM members have any closing comments. And from there, we could adjourn. So we'll start with uh, Nako. Thanks, Gus. Um, I, I just want to say I'm just so impressed with the presentations today. Uh, I'm honored to be on the same team as you folks. I really am, you know, what you do, what you've accomplished in, in this last 18 months is, is it's, it's, more, it's more than impressive, it's inspiring. The work that gets done, the expertise, the, 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 the uh, you know, experience that you bring to the table, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, it's my privilege and honor to be part of the same team as you are. I uh, thank you for everything. Uh, thank you for the work you do. I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to um, seeing everybody in, in January, got my fingers crossed, no question at all. And, and I got a deal, Gus, I'll buy the first round if you buy the second round. And there we go. <laughs> we have a deal. All right, folks, see you in St. Louis. Thanks so much. Okay, so why don't, uh, from there we go to <clears throat> ANACO IT, Commodore Linda Merriman. You demoted me. She's a D Nako. <laughs> D Nako. <laughs> that Thank was unintentional. You. I understand. And you've had quite a day. You've I been on camera have. and speaking the whole time. So I, I, there's lots of things I can say. Um, sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, thank you to everybody. As the only appointed member of Mexico, with all due respect to our elected colleagues, staff rocks. You do a superb job and I could not be prouder to call myself part of the staff. So thanks and like National Commodore, I look forward to seeing everybody in person in January. Thank you, Commodore Merriman. And I think we'll go uh, west to east. Commodore Kirkwood. Well, I concur with everybody's uh, comments so far. This has just been incredible, and it never ceases to amaze me how much work the directorates do. Um, you know, at the district level, we talk to our DSOs. We know from that what's kind of going on. But to really hear from the directors and to hear it, to see what they're doing, and uh, it's just amazing the amount of work that they do. This is always one of my favorite parts of attending N-Train or NACON. And uh, today I think was a great success. Thank you again for everybody that contributed today and contributed to the work uh, for the strategic plan and getting the work done to keep our voters safe. Thank you, Commodore. Commodore Mullally? Uh, again, to echo whatever else I said, thank you. Uh, again, the elected leadership, we guide, we tell people hey, is this not what we're looking to accomplish. But the staff, that's magic. That's when it comes about. That's what makes it materialize. So again, and I, I speak to all the NACOs and all the directors, all your branch chiefs, all the way down the, down the chain. Thank you again. Thank you, Commodore. Commodore Barth? Yes, I think this has been great today. It's really enlightening for the members to see what actually happens. There's so much mystique goes on about what does national staff really do? This gives a very good idea of what they really do, all the different projects they're working on, the amount of time and effort that's put in by every single member on national staff. We should all be very proud of what they do and thank every person, every single one of them. Thank you and a great meeting today and just hope everybody learned quite a bit and feels much more enlightened than they did. Thank you. Commodore Crane. Well, it's always a pleasure and always enlightening to hear the, uh, the work of the directors and uh, to uh, receive the information that we get. Very well done. 
particularly uh, enjoy all of the programs and Commodore Schaefer is always just a great joy to listen to. There's no doubt about that. Okay, last but never least, Captain uh, Troy Glendy, Chief Director. Thank you, guys. The, uh, all I can say is, wow. Uh, every, every time I have, every meeting I go to, I'm just continually impressed with the amount of uh, work that is being done and uh, just uh, truly, truly echoing the uh, Admiral Bushman's and Admiral Mauger's uh, words as being, I'm, I'm honored to be your chief director um, and to be the, uh, be the chief director of the best uh, volunteer organization in the world. I believe that was Admiral Bushman's uh, words there. So um, I look forward to meet. I know I've met a lot of y'all uh, virtually, but I'm very looking forward, fingers crossed, to meet you all in person in January. So, and one more thank you for all that you do for not only our country, but for our Coast Guard. Thank you, Captain. And immediate past National Commodore Larry King. Commodore King. Thought you forgot me for a minute there, guys. You know, this is my ninth OPCOM. <clears throat> I'm always impressed when I walk out. Um, every one of us at NEXCON level learns something. Um, we do pay attention to areas that, that certainly the Dean ACOs have accountability for, uh, but you, you hear what goes on in the other areas. So we cross pollinate information and it's always overwhelming. I think that's especially true uh, this, this year since all this work that you're talking about was done from home, uh, done on Zoom calls, done over the telephone, done with emails, and, and that's hard. I understand that's hard, but bless your hearts, <laughs> uh, the success, you know, people just look at this as another opportunity to excel, I think. So the work was phenomenal, uh, like others. Very proud to be a, a member of this organization. Thank you. Commodore, I try to write in order, but I don't always read in order. So thank you for understanding. So you're out of order, I guess. <laughs> I am. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge Terry Barth. Terry, thank you for all your hard work helping me put this together. I, I could have never have done this without your efforts. And even in your diminished capacity, one-legged on a scooter, you were there for me. Thank you so much. <clears throat> You're welcome. <laughs> okay, I think with that, uh, we can close this out. And I believe we have another successful OPCOM in the book. Thank you, one and all. Good buddy. Goodbye, Thank you, all. Commodore. Goodbye, all. Goodbye, all. See you tomorrow. Excellent Bye. job. Thank, Thank you. And all. Great job. Congratulations, Gus and Alex. Bye, all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all for joining us online. This will conclude this afternoon's webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.